then let's begin. Good evening. I hereby call the Palm Springs regular city council meeting of October 28th, 2021 to order. Council member Garner, would you like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Sure. Please stand if you are willing. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which we stand, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much, Council Member Garner. Next, City Clerk, if you could please conduct a roll call. Council Member Garner. Here. Council Member Kors. Here. Council Member Woods. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Aye. Mayor Holstead. Here. All council members are present. Thank you. Next, we have three presentation presentations tonight. So the first is an update about the Monarch Apartments groundbreaking. I think we have a few slides for the council and the community. Um, so today you see us there. Thank you to staff for putting these together because we were just doing this less than four hours ago. Um, today we had our groundbreaking for Chalks Monarch Apartments, which is the city's first new affordable housing project in over a decade. So we were joined there by state treasurer Fiona Ma, um, who's so committed to our region. And um, actually this is the second time in two weeks, I think I've seen her in the Inland Empire. So really great to her leadership for being present in Palm Springs um, to celebrate this with us, as well as Supervisor Perez, um, who's also been a leader um, with the county in supporting this project. So this will be 60 multifamily affordable housing units. Um, you can see the address there on the slide and you can see us in the groundbreaking. Um, so the city Council unanimously supported this project and moved it forward and we um, provided nearly $3 million um, in, in value to this project. So we um, provided the city owned land, um, which is almost a million dollars. We gave direct funding um, over a million dollars to this project. And um, we also waived fees and things like that to make sure this project got done. Um, so this is a long time coming. I actually met with Chalk four years ago um, when I was a council member elect and they wanted to come to Palm Springs and do their first project in Southern California. Um, and we said yes, and the city council continued to support them um, through a difficult role because it's so difficult to get these projects financed. Um, they've done an incredible job. We're so grateful for their leadership and for the 60 uh, units for families um, who will be able to um, affordably live in Palm Springs, which is so needed um, now during our housing crisis. So thank you to um, the county and Chalk and, um, and Treasurer Ma and everyone in the full city council, really. This has been um, years and years of work um, and city staff and county staff as well. So we wanted to update the community about the great news um, that we are seeing our housing policies pay off and result in housing being built in the city of Palm Springs. Next, we have a presentation for the new downtown park grand opening celebration. I think I'm giving this presentation too, but um, city council, feel free to jump in. We can, you can um, add your comments at the end. And if you have them about the Monarch homes, um, you can as well. I know Mayor Pro Tem Middleton and Council Member Woods were there today at the groundbreaking. Um, and we were there together at the new downtown park. Um, the park is now open, brought to you by the city of Palm Springs and our Measure J tax dollars. Thank you so much to our residents for taxing themselves um, with Measure J, a one cent sales tax um, to fund the downtown downtown redevelopment and finalizing or um, redevelop downtown and investing in an amenity like this, which is a beautiful park for our community. Um, if you haven't been there, we encourage you, uh, please visit, take photos, post them on social media, bring your friends and family. So you can see just this 
beautiful um, water feature with a waterfall and um, water on the ground for kids and anyone who wants to play in the water. I know that was my favorite part of the opening was watching the kids splash around in the water. Um, we had a pooch contest, a Halloween um, costume contest for dogs. You can see a photo there um, and then you can see stakeholders. So thank you to Measure J, commissioners, the chair of the commission, um, Parks and Rec Commission, city staff, um, all of the, you know, everyone who's involved in the construction and design and especially um, Rios for just a really beautiful, incredible um, park, which is such a testament to our community and our natural environment. Um, and then down at the bottom, you can see that we have an amphitheater for free community events um, and concerts in the park, which I'm just so excited about. So you can see there ABBA Fab. Um, playing and we got to um, enjoy their music. So great community um, event. So glad that um, everyone who was able to make it and celebrate and looking forward to decades and decades um, more to come of, of fun and community gathering um, at this park. Do any council members have any comments on those presentations that you'd like to add? Seeing none, um, that next we will move to our city manager, Justin Clifton, and our acting police chief, uh, Melissa Demeray, on an update on implicit bias training. City manager. Thank you very much, Mayor and Council. Uh, we had a uh, leadership team meeting last week, or actually earlier this week, where acting chief Demeray presented on some of the training that our police department has done, which was not only great to impart some of that knowledge on the rest of the team, but I just noted how impressive it is that while the team is um, somewhat shorthanded and overextended, um, that they continue to push forward, not just on the basic training that's needed, um, but really the training that's needed in the modern era of policing, where we're always trying to improve relationships with community members. Um, and the content was really rich. So I wanted uh, the acting chief to come in and just explain a little bit to you in the community about some of the things that our officers are doing, um, both uh, officers and support staff, uh, to really modernize um, and, and to account for the kinds of training like implicit bias that are really necessary to make sure that we're serving all of Palm Springs. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to the acting chief to give you a few more details on the training program. Thank you very much. So over the span of three weeks, we presented a principled policing course to our entire department. This training was so important that we presented it to both our law enforcement officers and our non-sworn professional staff. Each of these courses were a full day of training, and tonight I'm going to share just a small portion of the material that was presented during that training um, at our department. In addition to learning about procedural justice and implicit bias, we talked about our goals in policing and expectations of and for law enforcement officers. We learned about and defined different types of bias, including stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination. And we also discussed the historical role of policing and the impact that that history has on modern day policing. This course is based on a curriculum developed by Stanford and Yale University professors and in partnership with the Chicago Police Department. The course material was created and brought to California in partnership with the California Peace Officer Standards and Training, the California Department of Justice, the Oakland and Stockton Police Department's Stanford Spark, and the California Partnership for Safe Communities. Palm Springs Police Department Sergeants Miguel Torres and Pedro Nanez and Officers Josh Crocker and Stephanie Sandoval attended a Train the Trainer course on these topics at the Stockton Police Department. And they brought this presentation and provided the training to our entire staff. The training prompted some really constructive conversation and was incredibly well received by our team. We talked about the four tenets of procedural justice. Those are voice, neutrality, respect, and trustworthiness. And although we talked about these tenets primarily framed from a law enforcement perspective, these are applicable in all of our lives, both personally and professionally. Trust is built by giving others a voice, treating them with dignity and respect, and being neutral and transparent when we make decisions. There is a direct correlation between procedural justice and police legitimacy. If officers are given a voice, decisions are made with transparency, they are treated with respect, and there's trust within our organization, they are in turn more apt to treat those that they come into contact with the same way. A community's perception of their law enforcement organization or the legitimacy of it is shaped by an officer's encounter and whether they believe that those encounters are procedurally just. 
This doesn't mean that officers don't make arrests or hold violators accountable or refrain from having tough conversations. What it does mean is that our interactions are done in a way that preserves dignity and works to build a greater level of trust. Implicit bias are, is thoughts and feelings about people that we're unaware of and can influence ours and others' actions. It's unconsciously developed. Everyone has bias and no one is immune to it. The human brain automatically processes and categorizes information that it receives. We all have our own individual personal experiences and different stimuli in our lives. And our brain processes this information that we've received and unconsciously attributes traits or characteristics that may be unique to an individual and applies them into an entire group of people. We can develop feelings or beliefs about people based on our own personal experiences, the, the, pers the experiences that have been shared with us, to, with us by others, how and where we were raised, our profession, and even television and movies and media and social media can have an impact on that. We can have implicit biases on any number of things, including race, gender, age, sexual orientation, ethnicity, profession, or disability. Relying on bias leads us to oversimplified conclusions about an entire group of people. Implicit bias can affect how we perceive things, how we behave, where we direct our attention, how we interpret people's behavior, and how we interact with others. Studies have shown that when we're tired, stressed, threatened, multitasking, or new at something, we rely more heavily on implicit bias. And although we all have bias, recognition and awareness of this bias is a first step in mitigating the impact that it has on us. As law enforcement officers, we can mitigate our biases by attending training courses like the one that we hosted, better managing our time, reducing stress and fatigue, holding ourselves accountable, and continuing to have positive contacts with the community. We work to provide an exceptional level of service to the city of Palm Springs, but recognize that in the United States, officers have enforced laws and engaged in discriminatory behavior based on race, race ethnicity, and sexual orientation. There are those that have abused their power, exceeded their lawful authority, and violated community trust. We discuss that the impact that this history, some of it very recent, has, ha has on police and community relations right now. The photograph on the left side of this slide shows a law enforcement officer wrestling an American flag from a young man in Jackson, Mississippi in 1955, while his partner holds a sign that says, no more police brutality. The picture in the center is a memorial erected at the Stonewall Inn in 2019, 50 years after it was raided by New York City police officers as part of ongoing police harassment of the LGBTQ community. The last photograph is George Floyd, whose murder at the hands of former Minneapolis officer Derek Chauvin sparked a national conversation about police accountability and reform. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, the Convict Lease Program, Jim Crow laws, Japanese American internment, and Rosa Parks' fight against segregation. All of these are examples where policing was used as a form of control and law enforcement detained or arrested people based on race or, race or ethnicity. The Knapp Commission concluded that the New York Police Department had systematic corruption problems and Rodney King was beaten by LAPD officers. So we talked about what we can do and how we move forward together as law enforcement and communities, understanding that people that we come into contact may distrust or even be fearful of law enforcement. We recognize that we have the opportunity to impact perception with every single contact that we make. We have some very unique opportunities to connect with our community here in Palm Springs, with our community police academies that we host in both English and Spanish, our police explorer program, our school resource officer program, national night out, town hall meetings, toy drives, and organized neighborhood involvement, just to name a few. Chances to have positive impacts are not limited to these situations because we have the ability to practice the tenets of procedural justice with every single contact we make. We can build trust, give people a voice, and have the opportunity to change their mind and hearts. We share an outstanding relationship with our community, but we recognize that as law enforcement officers, we have a profound responsibility and obligation to this city and to the law enforcement profession as a whole to hold ourselves accountable. We are gonna to continue to incorporate the concepts that I've shared with you today in our everyday interactions and with ongoing training. Thank you for allowing us to share this. Thank you, Acting Chief, very much appreciate it. Do any council members have questions? for the presentation. Seeing none, thank you so much. Thank you for doing this uh, with our police department. We appreciate your leadership. 
The next item is acceptance of the agenda. City Council will discuss the order of the agenda, may amend the order, add urgency items, note abstentions or no votes on the consent calendar items, or request consent calendar items be removed for separate discussion. I'd like to entertain a motion for acceptance of the agenda. Are there any item or items that staff or council members would like removed? First, I'll start with um, staff. Do you have any items at this time? No, Mayor. Thank you. Do any council members have any items they'd like to remove for separate discussion or um, note abstentions or no votes? Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I would like to remove item 1I as an Indian Canyon, and I would like to request uh, that we move item 5C, the discussion of the potential navigation center up to the beginning of our uh, discussion uh, so that we can uh, deal with this issue when we are at our freshest. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I just was discussing, we often put um, important conversations at the very end when it's very late. So I appreciate you raising that. Um, so I see is in Kauia. Thank you, great job with the Palm Springs theme. Um, and so that would be to consider that after public hearings. Is I, that right? I'd like to move it right to the very beginning. Before Perfect, that. so after the consent calendar. Yes, please. City clerk, would that work? Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Any other council members like to poll or um, note votes for consent calendar items? Not seeing any, can I have a motion to accept the order of the agenda with item 5C to occur following consideration of the excluded consent calendar items and um, item 1I as an Indian Canyon uh, pulled for separate discussion. Can I have a motion and a second, please? So moved. I'll second. Thank you. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Woods. Yes. Council Member Coors. Yes. Council Member Garner. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Aye. Mayor Holstitch. Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. Um, next, we would like to request a report of closed session from our city attorney, Jeff Ballinger. Yes, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council, members of the public. The City Council met earlier in closed session to discuss the items that are listed on tonight's agenda and there was no reportable action. Thank you. The next item is public testimony. This time has been set aside for members of the public to address the city council on non-public hearing agenda items only. It's always a mouthful. Um, so agenda items on the council agenda that are not public hearing items. Two minutes will be assigned to each speaker. You're asked to please begin your time by telling us what a agenda item or items you're speaking about. Please note that testimony for public hearings will be taken at the time of the public hearing and general public comment for subjects not on the agenda will be taken later in the evening. We shoot for around 9 p.m. So tonight the city clerk will be contacting speakers by telephone. City clerk, if you could please begin. David Friedman, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Holstead, Mayor Portem Middleton, and council members. My name is David Friedman. I am Vice Chair of the Sustainability Commission, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Commission on Agenda Item 5B. As outlined in the Climate Action Roadmap and Staff Report developed with input from the Commission, climate change has a profound impact on Palm Springs, from droughts to extreme heat to fires in the nearby hills. Although the city has taken actions such as the move to carbon-free energy from desert community energy that led the city to achieve its goal of reducing GHG emissions to 1990 levels by 2020, much more work needs to be done to achieve additional state GHG reduction and energy efficiency goals. The commission has done substantial work developing two ordinance proposals referred to in the staff report, one to require energy efficiency standards for existing single-family homes beyond the California Energy 
code and another to require cannabis grow facilities and larger commercial businesses to use carbon-free energy. Further GHG reductions can be achieved by adopting cost-effective electrification requirements for new buildings, as many other California jurisdictions have done. We request council direction on whether to move forward with our work on these ordinance proposals and conduct further research on building electrification options with input from staff and consultants as needed and bring ordinances to council for consideration following stakeholder input. Council should also provide direction on actions to reduce GHG emissions from transportation and the city's internal operations. Most importantly, the fight against climate change requires additional staff resources and a coordinated commitment to sustainability across all city departments, not just the Office of Sustainability. Palm Springs must continue to demonstrate its sustainability leadership with personal personnel and policies that will serve as an example to our Valley and State. Thank you for your consideration. I am available for any questions you may have. Thank you. Ragda Zachariah, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Good afternoon, City Council. Hope everything is well and thank you for the beautiful park downtown. Um, I'm calling regarding two items. The first one about the homeless building uh, that project you're planning to conduct. We are, and my neighborhood, we are, not in, we are all for finding a solution for homelessness. However, this location does not, is not the right location. This area is highly uh, intensified by a residential area. We already have a problem with drugs, shooting, and, and theft. Um, it's going to cost you $6 million, and I know you. this is attracting to you because of the two buildings on it, which is a teardown. So I urge you to move it to another location. You do have other options, um, as this is going to make a huge problem for District 1. Uh, the other item I would like to speak, I am all for freedom of speech and politics. I just kind of scratching my head when I found that you're planning to send a letter to the district attorney ACLU regarding uh, Sheriff Bianco. I am all for speaking out. However, I look at it, the city council job is to take care of the city of Palm Springs. This is political. And I know the mayor, we still like mayor, that is running for, uh, for a position, but that's the right time to bring that in voting. Um, I'm not really, I don't understand why you're bringing the name of the city of Palm Spring and filing a lawsuit and so on. And the other thing I would, in your discussion, I'd like to hear from the city manager his thoughts on this. And I also noticed that you have more than one organization and I'd like every single organization is spelled out that is going to be in cooperation of filing that lawsuit. I think it's not Raga. a priority. It's going to create a problem. Raga, and let's leave it to the voters. Thank you so much and now. have a great evening. Francisco Ramos, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen and distinguished council members. My name is Francisco Ramos. I'm giving comments tonight on behalf of Joy Solver, a Palm Springs resident. The first comment is regarding the Homeless Navigation Center. Joy would like to reiterate that uh, I would like to go on record as supporting the Palm Springs proposed Homeless Navigation Center, poised to provide a full suite of support services necessary to serve our unhoused population. Navigation centers have proven effective in meeting the needs of the unhoused in our cities, and we are sorely in need of this flexible approach to services that allows our city to accommodate individuals who otherwise face barriers to coming indoors. In light of the city's recent success with Martha's Village and the kitchen's ability to provide its professional management to the Palm Springs Access Center, I have full confidence in the Palm Springs Partnership. Martha's, one of the largest providers of homeless services in the Coachella Valley and Riverside County, has a history dating back to before 1990. Possessing the strong operational necessary for this endeavor, they have the experience to assure effectiveness and long-term sustainability of a navigational center. Thank you to the City Council for moving forward with this proposal, to those who advocate from the county inside, and to the advocates and residents supporting this solution. My second comment is regarding uh, Sheriff Chad Bianco. 
Again, from Joy, I would like to voice my support to the City Council for issuing a letter of support for the ACLU's request for investigation into Sheriff Bianco. He is among those sheriffs who believe that they are above the law and has repeatedly demonstrated that he is an extremist with dangerous views. He has added many guns to our streets since he's become elected. His conspiratorial, anti-vaxxer, anti-masker rants are on mainstream and social media. His idea of public safety is shown by his use of excessive force, his racist policies, and his inability to do his actual job has put all of Riverside County at risk. He must be held accountable, and we must vote him out. Thank you for your courage and commitment to stand up for the city of Palm Springs, and thank you for your role in protecting our democracy. From Joy Silver, co-chair of the Bianco Mosco campaign, and myself, Francisco Ramos. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Steve Aguilar, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Hello, commissioners and staff. Um, uh, exotic extractions. Uh, rents the uh, warehouse at 1251 Montavo Way. Uh, I'm the owner of the building. Um, these these guys have been great tenants and uh, cooperate and do everything they're supposed to do in regards to cannabis guidelines. And I've had no issues with them as tenants. Um, I would like them to be able to uh, offer an additional service to, be able to deliver uh, cannabis to their prospective clients. Um, however, I'm a little confused in regards to the uh, retail storefront or non-retail storefront. Um, as I've emailed before, um, we already have a dispensary that built up a good business, and I don't want to have a two dispensaries with one building competing against each other. Just not the right thing to do and not uh, going to work for the other dispensary. But um, I do think there is a use for delivery in the Palm Springs area. And um, again, I'm not sure what the regulations are regarding non-storefront or storefront, but uh, I, I am not in favor of having retail storefront at this location. Thank you for your comments. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. <clears throat> Lena Sola, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, City Manager, and community members. My name is Lena Sola. I am a member of the Community Partnership on Homelessness. A complex issue like homelessness requires a combination of short, medium, and long-term programs. The city and county are addressing many of these, and I want to make sure that we don't lose sight of current needs. We applaud the city for pursuing the installation of a comprehensive navigation center for the unhoused. We commend the city for closing locations where homeless congregate to buy and sell illicit drugs. We endorse the city's decision to con contract with Martha's Kitchen to run the overnight cooling center at the First United Methodist Church during the summer months and set up an access center to provide additional services and case management. I volunteer at the overnight shelter and I have seen the clients steadily increase to full capacity. These clients are extremely thankful to have a place to eat, shower, store their belongings and sleep safely at night. This satisfies all the suggested criteria listed on page two of the staff report. These clients are respectful and are their own community. They are looking for jobs and permanent housing. Some suffer from mental, behavioral, and medical issues, but they are not the group you would associate with substance abuse. Now they are faced with another obstacle. The shelter is closing on October 31st. There needs to be a plan to provide an overnight shelter during the gap period when the shelter closes and the navigation center opens. A property with manufacturing or civic use money where no seat is required turned into a temporary shelter. The city is committed to provide our homeless a safe environment. What will become of these clients when they again become unsheltered and exposed to the elements and dangers of living on the street? Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. David Vignolo, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Halstage, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton, and Council members. My name is David Dignolo, and I'm speaking on item 1L, 
as in Lima, the request before you to consider whether to issue a letter to the Office of the Attorney General in support of the ACLU and other organizations' request for an investigation into the Riverside County Sheriff's Department and Sheriff Chad Bianco. As a member of the Riverside Alliance for Safety and Accountability and a Palm Springs resident, I strongly urge you to approve the city manager's recommendation. RASA is a coalition of community leaders and neighbors across the county, including many of your own constituents who are working together to hold our law enforcement accountable. Like you, we believe we are all safer by having forward-thinking leaders who believe in transparency, public safety, and equal protection under the law. As the draft letter notes, the Riverside Sheriff's Department and Sheriff Bianco have shirked their responsibility to enforce state and local laws and mandates, leaving our communities at risk for increased spread of the COVID-19 virus, potentially lengthening the pandemic in our region and leading to inconsistent enforcement and compliance throughout the county. Constitutional sheriffs like Sheriff Bianco encourage law enforcement officers to defy or minimally enforce laws that they decide are unconstitutional. They believe sheriffs are the ultimate authority with no limits to their power. This belief is not only unethical and wrong, but it's very dangerous. We stand with you in supporting this urgent call on behalf of all Palm Springs residents to the California Attorney General, requesting he immediately open an investigation into the Riverside Sheriff's Department with respect to persistently and humane jail conditions and Sheriff Bianco's refusal to protect people in Palm Springs and throughout the county from COVID-19 through the enforcement of legislative mandates and public health emergency orders. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Have a David Murphy, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Good evening, uh, City Council, City Manager and staff. I am David Murphy speaking on behalf of the Community Partnership on Homelessness regarding Agenda Topic 5C, the Navigation Center. But before commenting on the agenda topic, allow me to report that our group's petition to temporarily close and reclaim Barista Park generated over 200 signatures with 70 embedded comments in less than 48 hours of its launch a clear sign of high engagement on the issue. I'm certain the city manager and council appreciate the tremendous support that residents and businesses have for the city taking direct action, such as reclaiming the park. We also hope the city will fully leverage this community goodwill by completing the closure within days and not weeks, as reported in the press. The navigation center progress is extremely encouraging. The scope of the potential services outlined in the staff report is spot on. And hopefully the scope is more than just aspirational, but truly possible. We support the county and city's current focus on the one or two locations with existing buildings and infrastructure that promise the fastest path to full operations. Speed to open is critical given the magnitude of the crisis at hand on our streets. Secondly, the initial success of managing the secondary community impacts surrounding the new access center are really encouraging and lead us to be optimistic that the same will hold true for the new navigation center. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Jacob Bustos, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Good evening, City Council. My name is Jacob Bustos, owner of Exotic Extractions LLC. I am here to discuss line item 5A for a minor business modification at 1251 Montalvo Way, Unit L. Ever since Palm Springs opened the door to cannabis companies, I envisioned operating a retail delivery service out of the greater desert region. I first started down the path of cannabis operations within the city by applying for a distribution license in January 2020. About a year and a half later, we received our city and state cannabis distribution license. With the distribution business now operating, we looked to see through our original goal of operating a delivery service here in the city. 
Today you will vote on ex- vote to accept or deny my request, and I can only hope that you will see this as an opportunity for everyone involved to grow within the Palm Springs ecosystem and better serve those residents who would prefer getting their products delivered rather than an in-person visit. Currently, the cannabis business that operates within our building is operating as a dispensary slash lounge. We believe this cohesiveness will provide better access and growth within the greater Palm Springs area. Thank you for your time. Sincerely, Jacob Usos. Thank you. Santos Felix, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. Okay, yes, I am here um, to say that these numbers, ladies and gentlemen, I am, my name is Santos Felix. I would like to voice a concern and a solution to the homeless population in Palm Springs and throughout the Coachella Valley. The statistics say that only 55% of the homeless population suffer from a diagnosable mental illness and 44% suffer from addiction. I am here to say that these numbers are grossly understated because I personally go out every day to deliver meals that I prepare to homeless individuals in need of nourishment. Obviously, I make very small debt in the overwhelming need for food, but my resources are limited. I have not lived the most upstanding life for the first many years of my life, and as such, I feel a need to give back to those who suffer to the best of my ability. I ask the individuals I encounter many questions such as, where do you eat? Where do you use the restroom? Where do you sleep? What resources do you have available to you in regards to your mental illness or addiction? I would estimate that seven out of 10 of the homeless people I encounter claim they suffer from addiction and shockingly at least eight out of 10 claim that they suffer from an untreated, diagnosable mental illness. And there is very little help available to them in terms of immediate assistance to any of the resources necessary to attain mental health or help with their addiction. Many of the individuals have a primary issue of mental illness and a secondary issue of addiction. As a result of self-medicating, therefore leaving them hopeless, homeless, living in the alcoves, of storefronts urinating in public and committing crimes that would otherwise not be committed if they had shelter. Food resources to mental health professionals who had a sincere level of care and concern for the forgotten ones who live in the darkness suffer in silence Mr. and have no hope of ever becoming self-supporting through the contributions. I propose... Mr. Felix, to open your time is over. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Goodbye. Okay. Thank you. Sean Emerson, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Good evening. My name is Sean Emerson, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Community Partnership on Homelessness regarding Agenda Topic 5C, the Navigation Center. We are encouraged by progress made through the collaboration between the city and county on the funding and location options for the Navigation Center. We know that a lot of people have been working very hard on many levels to make this a reality. The Navigation Center, when fully operational, promises a path out of homelessness, addiction, as well as mental and behavioral health conditions. The model blends sobriety, counseling, housing, educational opportunities, employment training, and health care, including addiction counseling and treatment. After reviewing the staff report for the meeting tonight, a couple things occurred to me. One is that we hope the navigation will offer an array of flexible short-term shelter and housing options, such as overnight shelter beds, tiny or pallet houses, and small studio apartments for those that have graduated into a place where they are preparing for the responsibilities of more permanent housing. Secondly, we look forward to learning more about county and city plans to expand access to and capacity for addiction and mental health treatment services. We understand the current shortages of funding and space for these much needed services is an impediment to success. Thank you again for moving the Navigation Center forward. Good night. Thank you.
Brad Anderson, you have two minutes to provide your comments uh, to the City Council. Yes, Brad Anderson. I currently live in the city of Ransom Mirage. I was just told I have two minutes to talk on all three items that I asked to talk about. And there was a confusion, I guess, today. But anyway, this is a link rack, but I talked about that earlier. I want to talk about item 1A, 1E, and 1I. This is the AB361, which they're using to remotely do this meeting today. And there's very many issues wrong with that. And I'm going to start with this. This was drafted back in February 2020. And this is a whole month before the governor did his mandate. So this was a prearranged agreement to do this, and it's an urgency clause. So definitely look into it. And, of course, you, you didn't allow the citizens of your city to even review the law because you didn't include it in the uh, staff report today. And that's very critical. I would think that people would understand that. And then uh, item uh, 1E is the reappointment of the Control Rally Mosquito Vector Control District uh, appointed trustee, which was Doug Coot. Uh, this is a veterinarian in town. I used to go to him about 22 years ago. But uh, he also is the general manager's uh, partner in business with his wife, and uh, as he hired her way back 20 years ago. And he sat on two ad hoc committees for general manager for his uh, pay wage, and, and he should excuse himself from that. But there's very serious issues here with uh, credibility and ethics. And item 1I is the letter to the Attorney General uh, concerning the Sheriff's Department, Riverside County, which is not your Sheriff's Department or your place from it. And it's definitely political, and the mayor should be ashamed of herself. Thank you. And I'm speaking at the non-agenda items, too. Thank you. Goodbye. Dieter Crawford, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Good evening, uh, council, staff. My name is Dieter Crawford. I'm vice president of the Desert Highland Gateway Estates Community Action Association. I want to speak tonight on the potential homeless navigation center at 3589 McCarthy Road. Uh, we understand there's a big need for homeless services all over the country, and our city is not exempt. Palm Springs residents and businesses report worsening problems uh, with, un with the unhoused population, including increased rates of disturbance, trash, violence, mental illness, and substance abuse. However, the Desert Highland Gateway Estates area is not a good fit for this facility. As the community itself has its own problems with substance abuse, mental health, and violence. It seems the city pushes all the less desirable projects to this area, such as cannabis facilities, liquor stores, convenience stores, and affordable housing. Just today, the city broke ground on, an, on the Monarch housing development, located about a half a mile from the proposed location. Our neighborhood is already a food desert. There's no grocery stores, pharmacies, or banks. We're in desperate need for establishments to stabilize our community, not hinder it further. It's like redlining and de facto segregation to put the homeless services facilities in our neighborhood. This is NIMBYism at its finest. The city claims to be inclusive, diverse, and equitable, but none of this is evident in the north end of town. This is immediate adjacent to both single-family and multi-family residential uses and two federally subsidized apartment complexes. This project will negatively impact our residential communities nearby. The staff report uh, says the site is close to public transportation served by Sunline Transit Route Number 4. This means the homeless will travel directly through our neighborhood, which ultimately causes us to worry about our quality of life. There are several other locations around the city that Mr. would be Crawford? more accommodating and safer with regards to adjacent neighborhoods. Mr. Crawford, your, your time's up. Thanks for your time and consideration. Thank you. Gretchen Gutierrez, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you very much. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the council, and city staff. My name is Gretchen Gutierrez. I'm the CEO of the Desert Valley Builders Association. My comments tonight are addressed to item 5, uh, be on your agenda later uh, for discussion and consideration to a consulting contract to continue the work reviewing the greenhouse gas emissions 
um, that are being generated throughout the city and working towards reduction of those same set emissions. The two points I'd like to bring to your attention tonight and where my area of concern is and our industry's area of concern is, is that uh, gas continues, natural gas, uh, propane gas and other renewable sources are continued to be offered to the residential and business communities that we uh, seriously take into consideration our climate zones that we operate here and running to an all electrification grid um, would be cost prohibitive to the residents, not just of the city of Palm Springs, but throughout the Coachella Valley. We want to make sure that you consider those costs and uh, that they are a direct impact when electric bills go up of direct impact when those bills go up to the consumers, whether they are residential users or uh, business users. We'd also like to have you take into consideration older housing stock that predates 2010 and looking at those areas that those homeowners and those businesses could have assistance from the city with regards to uh, remodeling and renovations to bring them both up to code and energy efficiency. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you. Patrick Weiss, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Um, uh, hi, Honorable City Council. Um, my name is Patrick Weiss. I'm going to speak regarding Agenda 5C on the Navigation Center. Um, I am strongly in support of the Navigation Center. I am glad to see that something permanent and includes wraparound services uh, for our home lots is now being uh, proposed. Um, and I'm glad to see some of that $10 million that was originally given to the city is being used for that. Um, one of the things I think the Navigation Center will do is improve the quality of life for the homeless and for Palm Springs, as it will get many um, homeless off the streets of Palm Springs and given needed help. Uh, um, one of the things about uh, placing it in, in, in the city is you're going to have nimbyism no matter where you put it. And I think convincing the people in that area that this is different from the previous um, issue where we had the uh, drop-in center downtown, it will not be the same as that where people will not be hanging around outside, et cetera, and you'll have uh, specific rules and stuff around for that. My concern is um, not to be uh, dissuaded from doing this and to use the public domain laws if needed to improve the quality of life for the homeless and Palm Springs if, if, if need be. But I believe this overall is good. The other concern I have is that we take care of the local homeless first, people who have become homeless uh, in the Coachella Valley, Palm Springs, and Riverside County. People from outside the area, uh, if there could be rules and regulations regarding who we accept uh, at the navigation center. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jenny Fote, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you so much. Um, you know, it's so sad that every day uh, I read or hear that we really need to do something about the homeless, and then it's followed by, just don't do it in my neighborhood. So I'm calling because this pro the proposed navigation center is in my neighborhood, and I am 100% in favor of it. We do have a serious problem with people not having homes. The unhoused in our community has hit a critical level, and I, I really want to compliment the city on, on looking at this in such a, uh, a broad way in that it's not going to just be uh, fixing one little part of it. So everything I've read in the staff report I'm excited about uh, the the buildings on there are perfectly suited uh, for this purpose. 
Um, there's going to be uh, so many services provided there, uh, and the city is, is looking at all of those services, from small, tiny homes to actual shelter beds to uh, job training to, and everyone knows to my favorite thing is people, and one of the reasons why Roy's failed is because they didn't allow uh, uh, homeless people that had animals to come on the property. And uh, so... So I think that this is going to have a place for animals. It has a, a lovely park uh, is planned for it. So I, I really compliment the city council and the staff on selecting this site. It can be up and running much quicker than building something from the ground. And again, it is in my neighborhood, and I 100% support it. Uh, just quickly on another topic, I really think the city has to do something about the College of the Desert. I read today uh, about uh, they're canceling what they were going to do in Cathedral City. We have a big hole in the middle of our city with nothing done. I was part of the group that worked really hard in, I think it was 2004, 2005, to pass the res the uh, uh, the bond issue that gave them all the money that they have. And since then, mm -hmm. they've done nothing but squander money. And they squandered money on what was supposed to be a great project that they were doing millions Ms. of dollars in, Ms. Ford, in that's, North Palm Springs. Now they've squandered millions of dollars in Ms. destroying Ford, I'm sorry, that mall. We're going to need to disconnect and now. Thank I just you. need, I just. Madam Mayor, that concludes public comment. Uh, Madam Mayor and City Council, that does conclude public comment for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, City Clerk. Thank you to everyone for calling in and for engaging with us and participating. Um, we very much appreciate your public comments and your participation. So the next item is City Council and City Manager comments and reports. City Manager, do you have a report at this time? Nothing this evening, Mayor. Thank you. Um, City Council, City Council reports who'd like to begin. Council Member Garner. Since I don't have reports all the time, I'll go first. Um, I do wanted to just let people know that um, CVEP is having their 17th annual Greater Palm Springs Summit. It will be November 18th at 9 a.m. So just wanted to flag that for um, our residents, but also our city council, since um, we've had more had lots of questions about CVEP. So this might be a good opportunity to check that out. Um, and I also, while I'm talking about CVEP, wanted to flag um, that this is something. Um, I want to discuss when we when we start um, talking about positions and commissions that we're on. I think again because we've been um, having lots of questions about CVEP, it's probably good to get a new representative so that we're hearing um, other perspectives and not just mine. Uh, Next, I wanted to talk about the District 1 Town Hall that I had on Monday. Um, there was a lot of discussion about the Navigation Center, which I'll save for another time. But I did want to say thank you to everyone um, who attended. It's always a pleasure to hear from um, residents and to just let people know. I thought it was it worked well, so uh, we're going to kind of rotate between uh, weekdays and weekends every other uh, every other time. That way we can kind of catch um, more people. The other is um, there's going to be a uh, Dia de los Muertos event on November 1st at, at 5 p.m. at the Palm Springs Pavilion. Our Parks and Recs team is um, taking this on, which I really appreciate. Um, last year, um, I did this with um, my mom and a local artist, and we set it up in Vista del Monte, near Vista del Monte, and it was really fun, um, but it was also um, a lot of logistics, and so it's really cool that Parks and Rec is doing it this year, um, and I get to just attend, <laughs> which is nice for me. Um, the other thing is that um, I've been working with Habitat for Humanity for a while now, and we finally were able to do a project in District 1. It's still ongoing, and once everything's finished and I have um, permission from the property owner, um, hopefully I can share some photos. But 
it was such a pleasure to be out in District 1 doing some hard work um, for a resident. Um, my parents were there too. We had a, a volunteer group from Google. And just so people know, um, Habitat for Humanity gets lots of requests for volunteering. And so what they do is they identify projects throughout the Coachella Valley. Um, and then they say, oh, sure, Google, you can come and help us with this project. So that's just kind of how, how it works. Um, but I, I just was really impressed with the organization and with how much more I know we can accomplish. And they were already identifying other places, um, residents that they wanted to knock on their door and ask them if they were interested as well. Um, so it was it was really great. And I do hope that um, I can talk about this in more depth um, coming up with our strategic planning, because I think there's a lot of, of really good work we can do in Palm Springs. Um, that is, it doesn't require too much of a heavy lift from city staff, but is still making sure that things are getting done in the city. And that's it. Thank you, Council Member Kors. Great. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just a few things. Um, la last week, uh, the Mayor, Council Member Woods, and I joined former Council Member J.R. Roberts at the Plaza Theater for a very exciting press conference. Um, and it was announced that uh, David C. Lee, who um, is a producer, director, writer of many any Emmy award-winning shows, including Frasier and The Jeffersons and Wings and Cheers, um, is has made a lead gift of $5 million to restore the Plaza Theater. Uh, and so one to one, thank David for that generosity and really thank JR who is working to fundraise the $10 million needed as a volunteer. Uh, and that's also a truly extraordinary contribution. It was a great event. And I think it really helps get that project that we were also excited about uh, pre-COVID back on track uh, and moving forward. So um, that was really great. Um, I also attended the uh, Palm Springs Animal Shelter's first scavenger hunt uh, fundraiser, which was really a blast. Uh, there are 25 teams of four or five um, for a first year event, it was great. Raised $40,000, maybe a little more to support the great work that our animal sculptor does. So very excited uh, to share that. And that's what I have. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Count Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Thank you. Uh, it's been a busy couple of weeks. So uh, as reported in the media, uh, last week, uh, Riverside County Transportation Commission uh, met, uh, made recommendations regarding additional uh, funding uh, for the uh, San Gorgonio Pass Coachella Valley uh, Rail Project, uh, specifically uh, request uh, for funding to complete environmental uh, review work. And I'm very pleased uh, that uh, the county supervisors uh, endorsed uh, that last week. Uh, the vote at RCTC to continue to keep moving forward on this project was unanimous for representing uh, individuals from every city in uh, Riverside County. So this is a project that uh, is starting to get some real enthusiasm. In the uh, public comments uh, time that was done a couple of months ago, uh, this project received over 500 uh, public comments. Uh, it was reported to us by staff that more typically it's something around 100 uh, comments. And I'm very pleased to be able to say that uh, more comments came from the city of Palm Springs uh, than all of, than any other city. In fact, we had almost as many comments from our city as the top two other cities combined. So there is clearly interest as we start to move forward. Also participated uh, in a Metrolink uh, Board of Directors meeting. I am an uh, alternate representing uh, the Riverside County Transportation Commission on Metrolink. Metrolink has uh, uh, encountered very substantial uh, drops in the number of passengers during the COVID crisis, primarily because uh, it has been identified uh, as a commuter uh, rail and that people use it for the overwhelming majority of the time to go to and from work. 
What is very pleasing is uh, the board and staff are recognizing that the future is in leisure travel for uh, rail, and we're seeing much more enthusiasm uh, back in metropolitan Los Angeles, Orange County, Ventura County, for making these connections uh, to our area. Lastly, a uh, couple of things from the Sunline Board of Directors uh, meeting. I want to really thank a couple of members of our community who reached out to me regarding some very problematic uh, uh, service with our, from our local taxi uh, providers. And in one instance, uh, an individual who is uh, disabled was left waiting for over two and a half hours. Uh, for a taxi to be picked up. Uh, that, uh, that report was moved on to Sunline, which is responsible for providing oversight of the taxi operators in the Coachella Valley. Uh, and uh, there has been, not just simply in our city, but throughout uh, the region, a very significant uptick in the number of complaints regarding taxi services. Uh, much of that is the result of a significant drop in the number of taxi drivers. Uh, going back to 2019 for the three cab companies here in the Coachella Valley, they averaged together approximately 100 drivers. At uh, the start of the COVID crisis, they were down to 36 drivers uh, for our entire region. That has now increased to approximately uh, 55 uh, drivers, but still well below what is needed uh, to be able to provide the level of service uh, that people are requesting and needing. I strongly encourage individuals who are calling for taxi service to be very uh, direct regarding the time frames that they need to be picked up. Uh, lastly, on Sunline, uh, and I really want to thank my colleague, Mayor Gregory for Cathedral, from Cathedral City, we pushed very strong uh, that as Sunline has been developing a uh, line in cooperation with Cal State uh, San Bernardino and the College of the Desert that is making a connection directly uh, from the COD campus to uh, San the San Bernardino campus with a stop at the Metrolink station in San Bernardino that there needed to be a place for folks in the West Valley to be picked up. And uh, uh, I'm pleased to report that that is going to happen. They are going to open a new stop that will be at the interchange of I-10 and Gene Autry uh, and Palm. And I want to ask uh, staff to work with uh, RCT, or excuse me, with Sunline and our neighboring cities so that we can build a park and ride facility where that stop is going to be to make it much uh, more convenient for our uh, residents across western uh, Coachella Valley to be able to uh, drive to that park and ride, get on a bus, and be dropped off at the doorstep of uh, the Metrolink uh, connection. Lastly, along with uh, Council Member uh, Garner, Council Member Woods, and Mayor Holstage, I was very pleased uh, this past Sunday to be present at the uh, ribbon cutting for the new mental health uh, facility reopening at the LGBT Community Center on North Palm Canyon in our city. Uh, the services there are free. They are much needed in our community. Uh, and thanks to the generosity of literally uh, dozens and hundreds of individuals in our community, most particularly the generosity of Eisenhower Medical Center, we now have a state-of-the-art uh, free mental health facility available to everyone, whether you're a member of the LGBTQ community or not. Thank you. Thank you so much. Council Member Woods. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just to everyone out there, we did it. 
and we are doing it. And let me just, for those of you who don't know, we have more than just these city council meetings. Most or all of us sit on several other entities outside of the city, keeping us incredibly busy doing the work of the city that's beyond just sitting at these council meetings. And when I say we did it, I mean our downtown park that was mentioned by our mayor. The turnout at the downtown park for its grand opening was phenomenal. And I mean, absolutely phenomenal. The detailing of the park, phenomenal. The overall park, phenomenal. It was a great event. We did it. We are still doing it. As Council Member Kors said, we are, we are starting off with the help of J.R. Roberts to redo and refurbish the Plaza Theater. We've done more ribbon cuttings uh, for new businesses after the pandemic than I can remember just in this last week alone. So new businesses are popping up, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, and as, as, as Mayor Pro Tem mentioned, um, the long awaited um, access, uh, rail access to Palm Springs that is more convenient than what we have is in the works. And with uh, federal funding, hopefully we'll see that before um, I'm in the grave uh, as far as that goes. And if I could have the slide up on the screen, this is something that I've talked about in the past. Um, what this is, is you can see construction workers and our own staff um, at some of the intersections here in the city of Palm Springs, putting in wiring for a, a, what they call CV sync, which is traffic signalization and optimization. So those of you who don't know, Coachella Valley Association of Governments is a um, regional body that represents all nine cities here in the Coachella Valley, as well as other entities. And they call it CVAG. And their major effort um, in this project was to advance the development of a valley-wide traffic signal interconnect master plan and signal signalization of, of both new and existing signals on regional roads. We've already signal synced here in Palm Springs. What this will do is it will create a talking point or a way for the whole valley to talk to us. So during things like special events or moving us on regional roads, it will be much more efficient. What will this do for us? It will, it will improve multimodal mobility. It's going to maximize highway and arterial system capacity. It's going to improve operational efficiency, safety, and the environment throughout the Coachella Valley. And by the environment, one thing we're going to be talking about later in this meeting is our greenhouse gases. So this will help in, uh, reduce greenhouse gases. And we'll see later in, in the meeting that a lot of those gases come from um, vehicle sources. And it's going to prepare the agencies in the Coachella Valley for the future by, emerging, by, by um, building for emergency, emerging, excuse me, transportation technology, including connected vehicles, autonomous vehicles, big data, integrated corridor management and smart cities. Within the city of Palm Springs, 34 signals are being modified or upgraded by the CVAG project. Those, those include 13 on Ramon Road and 21 of them are on Highway 111. So in the picture, I really wanna thank two of our staff members, Don and Joel for their leadership and working with CVAG to make this happen. So the last thing I want to mention is that um, one thing that makes us such a great city here is that we have festivals. We have many festivals here and we have many events that make the city really wonderful. And um, um, Council Member Gardner mentioned one, but I want to mention another one that is being put on by a recreation department and it's on October 29th. And it's called the Halloween, the Haunted Halloween drive through which is a free event at James O'Jesse Desert Highland Unity Center. And everyone's invited for Halloween to go there. Another event that's not sponsored by the city, but it's happening is Halloween in Palm Springs. And this is gonna be on the Arenas Road between Indian Canyon and Ciel, um, Cali and, and Celia. And um, this again is a free event. There will be a suggestion of a $5 donation as you enter to support local charities like DAP Health, Palm Springs Gay Men's Chorus, the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, Queer Community of the Center of the Desert, and Greater Palm Springs Pride. And that's going to go from 4 o'clock in the afternoon until um, after 8 p.m. 
And at 8 p.m., there's going to be a costume contest anyone can enter with $1,500 in prizes. Which is great. And then the last event that we have coming up, which most people know about in the city because it's so big, is Pride event the first weekend in November. And whether you're gay, lesbian, bisexual, or a supporter of, it's a great event to attend to. And we really, we have a local schools marching uh, in the parade, which is a f one of the first to ever do it in the country. So I'd encourage anybody who is interested in just having party in the street or seeing what goes on in the community to come out and participate. And with that, I thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you so much, Council Member Woods. I have a lot as well. We've had a really busy few weeks here in the city of Palm Springs, which is exciting that, um, you know, we're reopening and having these community events that we've so desperately missed over the next two years. So I'm going to go very quickly through some of the items that I've worked on or events that we've gone to. And then I have two policy requests um, that I'd like to add to council's list to consider. Um, so one, I've been holding um, bi-weekly COVID working group meetings with the hospitals, with community organizations. Um, and we've been doing that for over a year. Um, so to talk about issues that clients are facing of those organizations and also to be collaborating on providing testing and vaccination to the community. Um, I also attended the state had a webinar for their new guaranteed income pilot program. So you'll remember um, I joined mayors for a guaranteed income and the city council unanimously passed a resolution in support of uh, mayors for a guaranteed income. So the state of California has um, allocated $35 million for guaranteed income pilot programs, focusing on foster youth and pregnant people and possibly other uh, communities as well. So um, the state is allocating that in a regional way. Um, and so I've um, attended that to understand how we might be able to get some of those state dollars for guaranteed income for our residents into our community and into our residents' hands since it's so desperately needed. Um, we also um, attended, I think we might have talked about this before, but attended the Palm Springs um, Homecoming Parade, Palm Springs High School Homecoming Parade. Um, so I just wanted to give them a shout out, um, especially the Teacher of the Year who was honored there. Um, I also started, um, thanks to the Palm Springs Certified Farmers Market, I did a mayor's booth at the farmers market this past weekend. Um, me and Aiden um, were there answering residents' questions and um, talking to people about issues and just there within the community. And then we got to do our shopping afterwards. Um, so it was a really fun thing to do and be present in the community. And that's one thing I think we've missed being during COVID not really being able to have a physical presence in our community. So I'm hoping to do that mayor's um, booth, meet the mayor, ask the mayor questions, um, booth at the farmer's market and maybe at Village Fest too, if they'll have me. Um, I attended and represented the city and uh, the Coachella Valley Association of Governments with which Palm Springs chairs the executive committee this year. Um, we attended our CV link grant opening in Palm Desert and Palm Desert's um, San Pablo block party. So they've renovated that street San Pablo in council member Quintanilla's district. Um, and it was really beautiful to see what the city's done and to see CV link integrated and to you know, pedestrian areas um, and to see they had food trucks set up um, and they had a really beautiful community celebration. So it's so great to be there in Palm Desert. Um, I wanted to flag that uh, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton was awarded the the Legacy Award um, at the LGBTQ Center's Center Stage Gala um, at the Air Museum this past weekend, too. So it was such an honor um, to be there um, in support of Mayor Pro Tem and to hear her speak, which was incredibly powerful, and talk about um, staying in our communities as LGBTQ people um, and, and building better futures for the, the young people coming up behind us. So thank you to Mayor Pro Tem for all of her trailblazing and her leadership um, and congratulations to you for receiving that important award. 
I um, also wanted to note just a few upcoming items. So UC Riverside Women's Center is having their annual Persist Conference about women in politics. Um, Mayor Pro Tem and I have participated a few na years now, um, and we are speaking this weekend at that event about um, LGBTQ city council leadership and representation. So for anyone who's interested about issues around women in politics, please join us for that conference on Friday and Saturday. Uh, we have the DAP Desert AIDS Project, DAP Health Desert AIDS Walk coming up this weekend. So I wanted to invite the community to that as well. Um, many of us on city council will be there um, to uh, kick off the walk. So that's this coming Saturday in the morning. So registration starts at 7 a.m. And thank you to Council Member Woods for listing some of the Parks and Rec Halloween events. So I just wanted to flag that for the community too. Um, Parks and Rec put on a floating pumpkin patch uh, at our pool. And um, tomorrow they're doing a haunted Halloween drive through at James O. Jesse. Um, and there's a number of events. So I ask everyone to look for that information online. And please join us in celebrating Halloween in Palm Springs. Um, really glad that some of these events are coming back. Um, so my two policy requests. One, you just heard everything I did. Not everything I did. A portion of what I've done in the last week as city council. And as many of our residents know that these are part-time jobs that are paid part-time wages. Um, and I have a policy request um, for future council councils um, about child care um, access. So right now we don't have a policy to provide um, child care to residents who are attending these meetings or to support city staff or to support council members who might have additional child care costs or even elder care costs um, to participating in meetings and participating in city events. And I, as we we have elections coming up for city council. Um, I want to make sure that we continue to allow parents to fully participate um, in our city government. It makes it for richer um, conversations and a better democracy and better future for our kids and our families, um, as well as people who are caretaking for, for elders as well. Um, so very much would love to see us have a policy to support um, child care infrastructure um, in the city of Palm Springs for both council members and for the community. And then I received last in a busy few weeks. Um, last, I received a request for the city of Palm Springs to join the 30 by 30 coalition. So this is an international coalition that was proposed in April 2019 by a group of 19 prominent scientists. Um, for a global deal for nature. So designed to encourage world leaders and local leaders to prioritize conservation as a means to combat climate change and biodiversity loss. Um, hundreds of scientists and governments and residents around the world um, have signed on to this. So I am hoping um, to ask the city to consider supporting the 30 by 30 pledge. 70 mayors have already agreed to participate on a local level, 50 countries Countries have adopted programs for 30 by 30, and President Biden has launched that campaign, and Governor Gavin Newsom has signed an executive order in favor of the 30, 30 by campaign. 30 by 30 campaign, um, thinking that we will conserve 30% of our open space and nature by 2030. So I know that Palm Springs leads the way on climate response um, and conservation of our open spaces. Um, and I would love to see us have a conversation about signing the pledge and joining this coalition and also looking at what we can do locally to continue to conserve our open space. Um, so with that, if there are no other council member comments, we will move to the consent calendar. Um, so I will entertain a motion to accept the consent calendar without um, item 1i, which has been removed for separate discussion. Can I have a motion and a second, please? So moved. I'll second. Thank you. There's a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call vote on the consent calendar, please? Council member Woods. Yes. Council member Kors. Yes. Council member Garner. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Aye. Mayor Holstedge. 
Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. So next we will move to the excluded consent calendar items and the one and only is item one I as an Indian Canyon. This is um, a request to authorize issuance of a letter to the Office of the Attorney General in support of the ACLU's request for an investigation into the Sheriff Riverside County Sheriff's Department um, and Sheriff Chad Bianco and Mayor Pro Tem Middleton pulled this item. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I'm going to try to keep this very brief. Uh, the ACLU letter is an extremely powerful letter uh, and outlines a number of issues and, uh, and allegations, provides uh, some direct evidence uh, for those. If they are true, found to be true, uh, the consequences for these actions should be uh, rather considerable. Uh, the cover letter uh, is, uh, is, however, uh, something I need, think we need to be careful with regard to. Uh, the cover letter, as it's now written, in many respects is a repeat of what is in the letter uh, from the ACLU. Uh, what is going to be alleged uh, if the Attorney General uh, picks up and follows through with an investigation uh, is uh, an allegation that will immediately emerge uh, that uh, the Attorney General's investigation is politically motivated. Now, as we all know, the Attorney General will exercise his uh, judgment independent of any political pressure. Uh, that's what we elect uh, Attorney Generals to do in our state. And I think it's very important that we recognize uh, that it's the Attorney General's responsibility to make a determination as to whether or not uh, to follow through with the investigation. Uh, I think we should limit our remarks in referring this to the Attorney General to we are aware of this letter, we are concerned by the allegations, and we encourage the Attorney General to determine what is true and to determine whether or not an investigation is in order uh, and stop there. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Other comments on this item? Councilmember Kors. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you for your work on this. And I know uh, we both requested this be brought back um, because I do think, as Mayor Pro Tem mentioned, uh, that document really raises some very, very serious issues that need to be addressed. Um, I don't feel strongly about the cover letter as much as I do about us taking a position to let the attorney general know we want his office to look into this. Uh, so I'm flexible for me personally. I don't know what others think on how the letter is worded. Um, happy to work with the mayor on you know edits if that's what uh, the council wants to a final letter. Uh, but I strongly support our taking a position about these very serious allegations that impact you know everyone uh, in Riverside County. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Yes, and if the city clerk can just note for the minutes and we'll correct the staff report um, because council member Corris did request this item um, and um, I support it and I, I agree strongly um, support the request by the ACLU to request an investigation from the attorney general. Um, I think in thinking through the cover letter, the purpose was to also add the impacts to the city of Palm Springs. So we don't have direct knowledge. We work with the Riverside County Sheriff Department um, in our jails. Our police department works closely with them in transferring inmates. Um, people who are arrested in Palm Springs go to Riverside County jails. So 
Um, we very much have an interest in what happens in those jails, what happens to inmates, um, and then also how people are policed by the sheriff's department throughout our region. Um, I think we have um, we have seen that significant concerns have been raised um, meriting an investigation by the attorney general. Um, the I'm okay with Mayor Pro Tem's recommendation. Um, I'm happy to support that. Um, the only addition of the cover letter is the impact of the sheriff's decision to refuse to enforce public health orders, to put out misinformation and even conspiracy theories about the COVID-19 pandemic, which has harmed our residents um, and it created additional work for both us and our police department um, in responding to our public health orders and educating the public about um, responding to misinformation. So I think that was the benefit of the cover letter is to request an investigation um, related to that and the impacts on the city. Um, and then also the new information that Sheriff Bianco um, was a member of Oath Keepers, um, which is known to be an anti-government militia. Um, and then now his refusal to denounce that membership and denounce that organization um, following um, what we now know is their involvement in the insurrection on the nation's capital. Um, and that raises an issue, I think, for the city and our residents as well, as we heard from public comment. Um, but I, I defer to the council here if you want to issue one letter, it's always good to speak with one voice. Um, and so I'm, I'm fine with your proposal, just noting for the record um, that there are additional impacts and are additional issues that we would like the attorney general's office to investigate, not just the ACLU's um, allegations too. So Mayor Pro Tem, would you like to make a motion? Uh, my motion would be that uh, uh, we redraft the cover letter to include the things that you've just referenced uh, and to uh, uh, state that uh, uh, we encourage uh, strongly the attorney general to uh, follow up to determine what's an appropriate investigation and to come to a conclusion as to what the facts are uh, and that we greatly respect the independence and judgment of the attorney general. Thank you. And that's doing that really fast on the fly. And I'm sure that everybody, uh, whoever sits down to write this, will get it down much better than that. Thank you. So I will second that motion. Is sure. there any further discussion? Can we have a roll call vote, please? Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Aye. Mayor Holstedge. Yes. Council Member Garner. Yes. Council Member Coors. Yes. Council Member Woods. Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. The next item has been moved up. Um, so the next item is 5C, discussion of a potential navigation center at 3589 McCarthy Road. Um, so one, I'd like to note for city council, unfortunately, um, that my I have a potential financial interest conflict here. City attorney, help me out. Um, my husband is a broker and has one of the um, parcels listed in here for sale. Um, so I believe the city, I've talked to the city attorney about how I may legally participate. And I've asked uh, Mayor Pro Tim Middleton to lead the entire conversation for this agenda item. So city attorney, could you um, explain for the public what I am um, legally able to do and how we can proceed in bifurcating the issue that I have a conflict on? Yes, Mayor Holstage. Um, it's my understanding uh, that your spouse uh, is a broker on one of the properties that is being uh, considered as a possible location. Um, as a result, uh, you have what um, the FPPC would conclude is an economic interest in at least that one property. Um, and so you would be able to participate in the discussion of the other property locations, but what that would require would be for the council to uh, rule out and, and hear that one property in which you have a financial interest first. Uh, and then once that decision has been made by the rest of the council, you could re uh, return to the, the meeting room and participate in the discussion of the other locations. Um, I should note that um, you would be entitled to listen to the staff report and the public comments so that you could get the gist of those before you would have to um, remove yourself from the, from the virtual dais. 
uh, while the rest of the council considers that one property. Thank you very much. And so for the public and for the council, that one is 4775 East Ramon Road. It's option number three in the alternatives. Um, so if I can, I will hand it over to Mayor Pro Tem to facilitate the meeting. We have done this a few times when council members have conflicts, for example, on one organization we're funding and we might consider it separately, but I'll leave it up to the council to decide how you want to proceed. So we'll listen to the staff report. I'll remain and then um, I will remove, be removed from the meeting um, because of that conflict and then you can decide how you want to proceed and considering that item separately, um, that option separately and then if there is further discussion, um, I can participate as needed based on the city attorney's advice. So sorry that's complicated. Um, we have to work to make a living in Palm Springs and sometimes this happens. Um, so I appreciate um, everyone's um, help with this. So I'll kick it over to uh, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton to um, start with the staff report or asking for a staff report. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And I think we all understand the dilemma and the caution that you're exercising, but we know how uh, how strongly you feel on issues of homelessness. And we want to uh, ensure that your voice is heard as much as possible without creating a conflict for you. Uh, with that, uh, we will move on to uh, item 5C, a discussion of the potential navigation center at 3589 McCarthy Road. Uh, I'd like to begin by asking Greg Rodriguez, representing the County of Riverside, to provide a report to us. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, and we're pulling up the presentation right now. Um, uh, council staff, especially. Um, uh, my name is Greg Rodriguez. I'm not only a resident of Palm Springs, but I work for Supervisor Manuel Perez for the county. I'm also the chair of the county's continuum of care, and I'm subcontracted with uh, the Coachella Valley Association of Governments for the collaborative approach on homelessness within the Coachella Valley. I am also a neighbor of this project. Um, I just want to, um, I'm going to try and be brief, but I think you all know how crucial this issue is. I think we are at a precipice right now of a crisis here in the city and the western part of the valley, but also have a huge opportunity here with uh, not only location, in my opinion, but also the abundance of uh, political and community will, um, as well as possible financial resources to finally make something that many of us have been dreaming about for years uh, become a reality. I also, too, want to commend staff, especially um, City Manager Justin Clifton and Jay Verada for an absolutely incredible staff report. It's one of the best staff reports I've seen on this issue um, in my years doing this work. Work. I'm uh, up here to give a little bit of a historical perspective on uh, where we've come from, but additionally how we've gotten to uh, what I believe is a, uh, a crucial decision uh, to move forward tonight and, and again an exciting opportunity uh, for the city and western part of Coachella Valley. I'll then turn it over to Jay uh, Verada from uh, city staff to go over the particulars on the specific properties. I also too want to thank uh, the council. Um, for the collaborative approach in the city, um, especially Council Member Coors and, and Mayor Holstage, who I have worked with for years, um, addressing the homeless issues in Palm Springs and especially over the last two years um, in searching for this option of a navigation center. This has definitely not been an overnight decision. Um, this has come through a lot of research, collaboration, and again, uh, the and uh, seizing on some opportunities that we see. Make sure we get this right here. There we go. So a little bit about where we've been. Uh, for decades now, uh, the Coachella Valley, and specifically the eastern Coachella Valley, have been the primary shelter uh, bed capacity for Riverside County. Um, while CVRM, Coachella Valley Rescue Mission, and Martha's Village have primarily been shelters in the past, they do now operate on a full housing uh, first model. About a little over 12 years ago, I want to say now, under the leadership of former Councilwoman uh, Jenny Fote, uh, this Coachella Valley Station of 
governments, or CVAG, uh, created their homeless committee, and that was primarily to address the concerns of the need for a shelter uh, within the West Valley. At that time, they worked with uh, Roy Wilson, who was a super in, or county supervisor at that time, uh, to open Roy's uh, Desert Resource Center. As many people know, that was north of the I-10. The location was a bit challenging. Um, in the beginning, there was uh, good intentions about how that was going to operate, but as many people know, due to lack of funding and, and the location, it ended up only being a place for people to sleep overnight. So people were bussed up there or vanned up there from Sunrise Park and other locations uh, for overnight and then vanned back um, for the day. So it really didn't serve the needs um, that we needed. And, and again, at that time, shelters were really operating on a shelter model and not really utilizing the homeless first, or housing first, excuse me, and the wraparound services that we know are so much more effective today. Um, in uh, July, or I'm uh, sorry, in the spring of uh, 2017, literally a week after my boss was appointed to office, um, was the decision being made by the county in conjunction with CVAG to close Roy's. Again, this was due to um, some lack of funding, but again, just the inability for it to really serve the needs of the homelessness community in the western part of the valley. At this time, too, there was a national model that was proving quite successive, known as the Housing First model. And so CVAG really started to approach uh, the CV Housing First model. And again, the city of Palm Springs was a great leader um, in this effort as well. Additionally, I just want to kind of highlight some of the efforts that have been done, primarily, first of all, by the city of Palm Springs. I, I want to emphasize, too, that where we're at tonight is not all that we've done, and that there have been a lot of, I'm going to use piecemeal, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but really good approaches as far, especially with the resources available um, that were not available now um, in the past to address these efforts. Um, Palm Springs has been a leader on their budget all allocations. Um, they've dedicated public safety uh, staff out of the police department for homelessness outreach and efforts. They have embedded with contracting with the county um, behavioral health team and I'll get into a couple other funding things that they've done uh, recently too as well. We've also had an extremely uh, valuable increase in the collaborative efforts in the Coachella Valley. So I again want to give a shout out to Justin Clifton um, who over the past couple months has been convening uh, various service partners as well as county staff um, and other partners uh, in addressing collaborative efforts on how we really uh, look at a more comprehensive and direct approach on addressing these efforts. And then also the Riverside county efforts, it would behoove me not to mention some of the efforts we do, um, but again, in a collaborative way, um, have really been able to increase our funding levels, uh, primarily thanks to Governor Newsom and the budget and some of the other allocative efforts that have happened, some of the ARPA money, American Recovery Act, sorry for acronyms, um, that are coming down. Um, we have uh, increased our behavioral outreach teams. You'll see a much more targeted effort at that. Uh, we've opened the new Palm Springs uh, Community Health Center, uh, which is going to have comprehensive behavioral health and substance use services that will be able to uh, closely align with the navigation campus. And then also, again, our creation within the county over the last year and a half of our uh, new department that has uh, basically taken fragmented efforts over eight different departments amongst the county and created those under one in our homelessness, housing, and workforce solutions department. And then also over the past year and a half, as the chair of the continuum of care and a member of the board of governance, we have, as the county, gone through extensive strategic action planning and are excited about rolling out that action plan in January with a really focused look on regional and collaborative efforts that we've seen uh, uh, um, work very well here in the Valley. And then just a little bit about what we've accomplished. Um, again, I'll mention the CV Housing First program that then uh, was brought in-house. We had originally contracted that out with the provider from Riverside, but brought that into CVAG at the beginning of this year in 2021. And we have already seen an amazing amount of success as far as uh, really addressing the chronically homeless. The CV 200 basically addresses those members on our streets that are high utilizers of our public safety departments, as well as our hospital and emergency rooms. Uh, we work very closely with the City of Palm Springs and the Police Department. Captain Kovaloff is a huge partner in this effort as well as the rest of his staff um, and, and helping to do outreach, especially around those tr troubled areas like Barista Park. Uh, we implemented as a county project room key. I want to thank again the City of Palm Springs and some of the hotels that jumped on board immediately. This was a program that launched uh, in the beginning of the pandemic area to uh, make sure we were protecting those on the streets from uh, spreading the virus. Um, it was highly successful in the, in the fourth district here and more so here in Palm Springs where we actually have permanently placed over 90 individuals through that program. 
We, um, the city, as many of you know, has opened the boxing club as the access center. Um, we were lucky to be able to use that boxing club over three years ago now, believe it or not, as an overnight shelter when the county funded uh, three shelters for two years, one in Palm Springs, one in Desert Hot Springs, and one in Cathedral City. Obviously, when COVID hit, we had to move that one to the high school and then eventually to the United Methodist Church. So again, you look at the collaborative efforts that we've done. And then, of course, the summer cooling shelters, that's actually what I was referencing not the access center, um, but have been highly successful and again, uh, compliments to the collaborative efforts on that. I will highlight on both of these programs that what we have seen over the last three years at every location that we've had, there has been no negative impact to the neighboring communities due to the operations to the professional uh, operators, both CVRM and Martha's, due to the um, collaborative efforts with the police department um, and just the overall operations. We've had, actually have neighbors, you heard one tonight, that actually volunteer, that are happy to have these in their areas. We have not seen those areas. I would also highlight too, as we move on and talk about navigation centers and what their impacts are on community, staff did a really good job on pointing out other localities within the state of California, but I can also uh, say that through my research throughout the country, is that these type of centers actually have more of a positive effect on local communities than they do on a negative effect. And then just overall valley provider success, and again, this just gets back to some of the collaborative efforts that we've done and we really will be doing a collaborative effort on the Navigation Center no matter where it will be located. So what we still need, and um, you know, as, as I mentioned, homelessness is, is not a one type of system fits all. It's a comprehensive approach, and as we've moved through these various success models, whether it's CV Housing First, or the uh, cooling centers, or the access center, um, the services that our county staff provides, as well as our providers provide, we still know that there's one missing piece, and that's a West Valley Shelter Access, or a navigation center. It must use a Housing First model, because we know that that is a successful model. We've seen that normally in the Valley, but uh, statewide and national statistics to approve that. We must have comprehensive wraparound services is one thing to put someone in a shelter bed or into a unit and not provide them with the necessary behavioral health treatment, substance use services, access to services, and eventually access to permanent housing. And then I talk a lot about throughput with housing choices and what I'll outline in kind of the schematic design of the campus is we're doing a relative relatively good job now, um, whether it's county, city staff, providers, about our outreach efforts, about our transitional housing ability, about case management. Can we get better on all of them? Of course. But where we really lack the throughput is our, is our ability to get people into longer transitional housing and more important, permanent supportive housing. So as I said when I began, um, we are at a critical juncture and I think have an absolute amazing opportunity right now um, to offer a site I believe is not only ideally located, um, but also is has the ability to be up and running faster than any other uh, property that is proposed tonight. Um, again, we've never been presented with the opportunity before to have resources for capital improvements, for the property acquisition, more importantly for renovations, and then also the opportunities for opera operationalizing, uh, uh, cap or capitalizing, I'm sorry, uh, for operational expenses. I'll get into some of the financial details at the end of the presentation. Again, I just think we have the political and community will. Um, we have the funding streams available, and again, an, a site that can get online sooner than later. So I want to show a little bit of design, and I, I really really want to emphasize this is just an initial design of what the uh, proposed location will be. This is a fluid design that um, we will work with, um, the city I will say will work with uh, in partnership with the county, uh, with a service provider to really figure out what is going to be the ideal service um, requirements on this location. You'll see in the larger building at the top, uh, left-hand portion is the building C, which would be the primary shelter beds. These will be individual type units, so it's not a congregate as much shelter. Um, we're doing this one uh, because a lot of homeless individuals will not go to a shelter because of the fear of being in a congregate setting, um, whether that is fear of molestation or rape or just mental health issues of not being around other people. But also, too, God forbid, if we were ever to get into another pandemic situation, this would be a very much more healthy and secure uh, system. Obviously, within that building, you'll have the necessary facilities um, 
for that. And then off to the uh, right, you'll see basically some proposed elements, such as a medical clinic, um, obviously social services, behavioral health treatment, uh, uh, obviously cafeteria and kitchen setting. Um, within that, workforce development as well. A lot of what you see on site, especially like the kitchen, um, uh, food distribution, uh, employment center, are options for actual workforce development with on this site as well. We're looking at actual possible RV storage. Um, and when I say storage, as we know that we are seeing more and more homeless individuals park their RVs out in the desert. And so this will provide somewhat of a transitional uh, aspect for that. And then you'll see <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, at kind of the middle-ish uh, left-hand side, um, the, again, very rough designs. But what is really important here is about not just getting people into a shelter immediately, but having some transitional units to transition them out. And one of the callers had mentioned this on. And this is what's unique about this site compared to other um, shelter-type facilities throughout the state or country, is what we're looking for, again, is what I talk about a lot about throughput. So having that immediate access for the shelter system where law enforcement or discharges from hospitals have a place that we can provide a bed. But more importantly, having our case managers have a unit, a crisis stabilization unit, a transitional unit, whatever you want to call it, to transition those individuals out within two weeks to a month. And then they can remain there 30, 60, 90 days as we transition them into a more permanent supportive unit. Um, the caller, one of the callers mentioned like a studio. So again, looking at this whole holistic approach. Um, again, utilizing the housing first model and again really intense wraparound uh, services. I just kind of want to talk about um some of the funding mechanisms that I, that I believe we have a really good opportunity on here, um, both for capital and operational. I am not necessarily assigning allocation amounts to this, but uh, the county will be coming in uh, with the some dollars from the American Recovery Act plan that uh, the supervisor uh, received uh, by a vote of the board last week. Um, addition city contributions through their HAP funding. There is a new round of the Homeless Housing Assistance Program, round three coming out that we will be looking for funding for. Project Project Home Key, many of you might remember that we did, were successful in getting an award uh, last year by the state um, for Project Home Key, unfortunately, and that was for the Ivy Palm Project, and unfortunately, due to bankruptcy issues with that, that fell through. However, there are a lot less restrictions as far as the ability to use those funds. More importantly, there's a longer timeline than we had last time. So there's going to be a huge opportunity here in Project Home Key. I really want to emphasize, too, the next um, item about foundation and private contributions. And these really are going to play a vital role when we talk about ongoing operational costs. I for long have argued that I believe that if we had a vision like this, if we had a plan like this, that I know we have a very generous community here on the western end of the valley and actually throughout the valley that would be more than willing to contribute to this. I think the business community and the conversations I have had, I know that the mayor has had and council member Coors have had, are not only supportive of this uh, concept, but are willing to to uh, pony up, as, as we shall say. And then finally, I want to talk about the CalAIM opportunities. For those who do, do not know, uh, Medi-Cal is basically being renamed CalAIM and will go into effect in January. And what we see here, again, these are for ongoing operational costs, is the ability now to build through Medi-Cal or CalAIM for supportive services. So especially with a medical clinic on site, whoever we would contract that with, whether it would be somebody like a Borrego, DAP Health, or RUHS, um, uh, the opportunities for us to be billing for behavioral health services, for substance use services, for actually housing um, services, it, it's really, really exciting about where we're being able to go through these. A lot of that will be managed through uh, health plans and for here locally and the majority of our Medi-Cal recipients are on uh, IEHP or Inland Empire Health Plan. So you can see we're just not thinking about what the structural um, and um, service uh, side will be for a navigation campus in Palm Springs, but more importantly, we want to make sure that we can build this, that we can operate it, and that we can operate it in a sustainable manner. Um, just some next steps on this uh, before I turn it over to Jay is obviously continued community engagement. Any concerns that arise, uh, arise we want to make sure that we address and make sure that we're addressing those uh, with factual information based on other uh, uh, operations, not only within the city of Palm Springs and the Coachella Valley, but throughout Riverside County. Uh, the city will probably or someone will be going out for uh, a request for a proposal or an RFP, RFP for a provider. I believe we're looking at this doing this sooner or later so 
that we can involve that provider within the final um, uh, design and utilization of the site so that we make sure we're building something that is not only usable, but more importantly, that is the best benefit to our homeless individuals. Obviously, design finalization, budget finalization, securing those funding streams. We're already working on, on those as I speak. Uh, looking at how we expedite processes, not overcoming requirements that we need to do, but I think our goal here is to get something up and operating as quickly as we can in the most effective way as possible, and then obviously uh, renovations and development. So at this time, and I'm going to be happy to take questions at the end, um, again, I just want to thank the city for their leadership on this. It's been a real pleasure uh, working, uh, again, not only with city staff, but uh, both with you, Councilmember Kors, and, and, and Mayor Holstedge um, over these past years to, I, I think you can tell my excitement to see something I think we've been dreaming about really come to reality. So I'm very excited about that. And with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Verrata. Get all my papers out of the way, Jay. Wonderful. Thank you, Greg. That's um, really great information. Uh, Council, when we were presented with this opportunity, we wanted to do some basic due diligence before moving forward. And that includes comparing the price of the property with other properties, understanding the cost to build it out, and how long it would take for each of these options, and uh, the condition of the property. So to answer some of these questions, we uh, work with a local architect to provide input to help with the uh, cost and time frame. Uh, our development services department completed a phase one environmental, environmental analysis and had staff from building and fire inspect the property. Uh, and it looked, um, we also looked at some alternative sites. Um, next slide, please. Oh, no. Getting spoiled. Oh. All right, <clears throat> I hope you can see this. Um, we search for similar properties for sale. So industrial buildings, two acres or more, uh, 10,000 square feet or more, and uh, two properties came up. As you can see on the top section of the chart on the screen now, 4775 East Ramon and 1243 Gene Autry. And the average price per square foot for these properties is uh, $136.23. The higher of the price properties was $162.50. That's on a per square foot basis. And the lower was $120. The subject property we're looking at is at $126. So we are finding that this property is within the range of available industrial buildings that are on the market. Uh, we've also ordered an appraisal on the property, but that will not be complete for uh, another few weeks. Uh, we've evaluated the cost of using vacant land sites also, which is the uh, properties listed on the bottom half of the slide, and uh, we'll get into that discussion later. So looking at the uh, McCarthy site, 3589, uh, you can see, as has been discussed, it has uh, it's a three-building campus and making it easier to divide it for multiple uses and multiple service providers. It's important to note that there are no tenants currently, and there's no need to buy out leases or relocate uh, tenants. Uh, there is space to add tiny homes, and there is also space within a closed campus to enjoy outdoors, shielded from view from the street and neighbors. The property at 4775 Ramon, uh, I should note, uh, my understanding and from the listings we have is currently under contract. So this uh, is actually not uh, considered a target site, but it is used for comparison purposes uh, for to make sure that the property on McCarthy is the price being asked is uh, within the range of uh, properties on the market. And um, as we saw, this property uh, is available and at $162.50 per square foot. Uh, you know, you can attribute that to many things that it is higher than the McCarthy property given its location near a key intersection in the city. 
uh, has more exposure uh, and um, offers uh, some other benefits in that regard. There's another property at uh, 1243 Gene Autry, and this property is for sale now. Yes, it is at a lower price per square foot. However, it is smaller than the subject property at 28,000 square feet versus 46,760 square feet. But it also has 10 current tenants, and some of those leases for those tenants do not expire until 2026. So this is actually more of an investment opportunity for someone who would want to come along and take advantage of the rents. So uh, there are potential additional costs to buy out the leases, provide relocation payments, uh, pay loss of goodwill, and would take more time to negotiate uh, an acquisition if, if it was desired to have those tenants leave. So I uh, just wanted to point that out that this is a sort of challenge in that sense and there's no certainty that the tenants would agree to leave early. So for any of these buildings, the uh, rehab cost to convert it into a shelter, a kitchen, uh, would involve uh, adding, adding a commercial kitchen, indoor interior walls, new doors and new windows, at an estimated uh, cost per square foot of $155, so that is for an existing building. Uh, and I want to note also the cost per square foot for uh, creating a similar space on a vacant parcel is $377. And again, uh, we uh, asked the local architect to price out the cost of the building new and rehabbing, and these are the results we got from them. So uh, while vacant land can be acquired for less than uh, the land uh, with the buildings, um, there is a development cost that increases the overall cost of the project. And this involves adding curbs, paving, sidewalks, and gutters, stormwater drainage or storage, which is now required on site for new construction, uh, concrete foundations and slabs, framing, and it also uh, takes about twice as long to complete uh, a new project on a vacant site. And I believe one of the callers indicated, you know, uh, speed to market was, uh, or speed to um, delivering the product is uh, an important part of serving the uh, unhoused population. But we did look at some of these vacant land sites just for uh, comparison purposes again. And uh, the city owns this Gene Autry site. Um, City uh, uh, just south of the uh, McCarthy property we are talking about is another open parcel that is currently on the market. And um, this is another site we had previously discussed when identifying sites for a drop-in center. This is just south of the airport runway on Ramon across from Social Security Administration. And uh, on El Cielo, just south of the boxing club, uh, is this vacant lot that is uh, also available. But as I've uh, indicated, uh, building new, similar and comparable building uh, would be about $377 per square foot to construct or, for a sim or, or 15 million in total just for the building, for a similar building as what already exists on McCarthy. Uh, adding in the cost of the land would bring a project to 16 or $17 million total. And the time to build out from a new, uh, a new building is 24 months, which is twice as long as renovating uh, an existing building. Uh, again, um, might be hard to see on this slide, but um, the McCarthy site's price per square foot is not the highest, it's not the lowest, uh, but it is within the range of properties that are on the market. At the uh, acquisition price of 5.9 million plus an estimated rehabilitation cost of 6.2 million uh, would be a total cost on the McCarthy site of $12.1 million. As is shown in the table, uh, 
you can see that uh, 12.1 million with a 12 month time frame uh, is uh, one of the quicker options and the uh, acquisition price is within a reasonable range of similar properties on the market. We also wanted to point out that um, this location is in relation to other homeless services the city has been engaged with um, uh, is it, you can see the McCarthy property is identified with a star in the upper right uh, towards the center of that map you see there. Uh, hopefully you can see that. And it's, um, you can see from there uh, other facilities the, the city has been engaged with, such as the uh, overnight shelters at Demuth Park, uh, the um, boxing club, the Methodist Church overnight shelter, which is winding down, uh, where the Ivy Palm had been uh, proposed on uh, North Palm Canyon. Uh, you know, these are all uh, a good distance away from the uh, proposed site here. And again, these are for um, the uh, uh, project where the, city assist, where the city assisted with homelessness. Uh, I do want to point out that the uh, Chamber of Commerce and the Palm Springs Hotel Association uh, have uh, sent us support letters or indicated their support for pursuing a project at the McCarthy uh, property. And um, we're available to answer your questions. And we also have uh, the, uh, our consultants from Lazar available to discuss some best practices in terms of um, uh, providing homeless services. Thank you, Council. Uh, Jay and Greg, uh, thank you both for an outstanding report. Are there any discussion or questions from City Council? Councilmember Coors. Actually, I just wanted to raise the issue of um, if we're going to bifurcate one of the properties on Ramon, uh, where Mayor Holstage is recusing herself, we should probably do that before we ask any questions so she can be put in the, uh, the room where she is not participating with our conversation. All right, uh, then let's go ahead and if there's no objection, uh, take and have that discussion regarding uh, the Ramon project uh, so that uh, uh, the mayor can return. Uh, so. Uh, are there questions that uh, staff has regarding the Ramon location? Sure, I'll Go ahead, Council Member Coors. Um, so the Ramon location that has buildings on it, um, I don't know who the right person for this is. If it was up to become available uh, to buy again, um, how does that how does that fit in? Does that property work? Um, it looks like it's one big building versus some smaller ones. I just don't know the comparison. And um, I apologize, I didn't ask this first. But if if we went to if we were able to get that property um, and it fell out of contract, how does it compare to the one in McCarthy as far as being a good site? I see it's smaller. I think it's two point one acres or three point six four acres. Does that limit the number of modulars? I just want to get a sense how these two properties would compare. Uh, Councilman, yes, it is smaller. It would limit the number of modulars. The smaller building would limit the number of interior uh, units that could be constructed. Um, it is in a busier part of town uh, at the corner of um, uh, Ramon and uh, Gene Autry. Uh, it would occupy what could be a more valuable commercial space with, uh, say, showroom and uh, take advantage of that. So that is something that, um, you know, I don't want to say sub-optimize the use of the property, but um, that, that may be uh, a concern and, and it costs more. Okay. Thank you. Are there other questions regarding the Ramon pro uh, location? If there is not, then I do have a couple of questions. I see Councilmember Garner. Please go ahead. 
Are we just doing questions or? You can either do questions or comments, but we are concentrating on the location right. at uh, 4775 East Ramon right now. Okay, great. Um, just um, in, in terms of the location of the property, um, I just wanted to, to talk about that briefly um, because when you when you look at it on on the the map, which helps me, um, it's really close to a lot of um, businesses, which part of why I say that is a good thing is because if you're going to be in transitional housing and getting services and eventually getting a job, you're close to a bunch of places that have um, readily available entry level jobs, yeah. um, which I think is a really attractive thing. and. Um, so, so I just wanted to to state that as um, one of the reasons that I think it's an attractive property, but I I think the likelihood of it coming out of contract and and all of that is probably pretty low. So I'm fine with um, setting it aside, probably from our more general discussions. Council Member Woods, do you have any questions or comments on this? Okay, I do. I have a couple of questions then. Uh, the uh, contract uh, or tentative contract that uh, now exists, uh, how, how secure is that? Uh, is this, uh, uh, are we deal dealing with something that truly is moving forward or is uh, there some uncertain, uh, reasonable uncertainty to uh, whether or not this property is going to become available? And I know that asks for speculation, and staff hates to do that. Well, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, we um, really uh, looked at these properties to see what was on the market and compare the prices. It's just kind of noting that, well, this one is under contract, but uh, we got the data on the price. We do not know the um, status of that contract, uh, but we can, we might know somebody who does. <laughs> I, th I think it would be worthwhile before we uh, walk away from any consideration of this to have a, a sense of uh, who is looking at the pro at the property and, and and what the certainty is of it moving forward. As Councilmember Garner said, uh, it, from a location standpoint, it is a very busy street, but it's also a street. Uh, that's on a bus route and, uh, directly and has uh, uh, direct access uh, within a matter of just a couple of blocks to uh, a substantial, two substantial shopping centers, uh, one in, that includes a uh, general market. So uh, this is uh, this is a location, if it were available, would be one that we would, uh, it would seem, want to give some very serious consideration to. If it's not available, then uh, it's just not available. And Mayor Pro Tem, uh, it's Greg. If, if I can add, kind of going back on Councilmember Corson, just to address uh, Councilmember Gar uh, Garner's question too, is um, I think it's important as we're going after funding streams for truly what we're calling a navigation center, the ability to have the land for some housing components, um, which that site would not have. As far as access to amenities like stores and, and, and uh, workforce development, you know, again, the McCarthy property is close enough to bus line. It's really no further than what the Ivy Palm would have been. Uh, Michael's House, which operates around that area for years. Um, additionally, if you notice, not only our service providers within the valley here, but again, on these campus navigation models, an element of the workforce development that is built in is transportation and making sure that people have access, whether that is not only through bus lines, but actually through um, van transportation through uh, those centers as well. All right. Do we have a sense of, uh, in just in terms of numbers, of how many people we can house at uh, one location versus the other, given the square footage differences? You know, roughly right now, just based on the design of this, and if, if you take a comparable at least uh, square footage, um, you're looking at probably 50 to 75 at least shelter beds. 
it's really hard until we get a real firm um, selection on what kind of design, whether it's a pod home or more of a manufactured type structure that would be more, I believe, amenable. Um, and I don't want to sway this anyway, so I'll be careful on my language, um, uh, on what the capacity would be. Obviously, we're looking at maximizing as much capacity as far as more on the housing side um, than creating too many shelter beds that we wouldn't have a demand for. When you say 50 to 75, is that 50 to 75 additional total or? Uh, that would be like total shelter beds. And so I, I want to distinguish that that would be the shelter aspect of it. Um, and then, I mean, I there have been a couple companies that have looked at this property as far as the vacant site that they could build uh, modular type structures on, depending on the height you go, the size of the unit. You could feasibly get 100 units on that property um, easily if not even more. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Kors. Hi, and I don't know if this is for you, Greg, or Jay, or the consultant. So on the Ramon property, uh, it sounds like we could do similar shelter beds, but you may have sound like we can do any of the transitional housing, but I'm not sure if that's what you meant. So. Can you just clarify? Yeah. Like what I'm trying to get a sense of is how many people can we do the transitional housing? Correct. Before we say, decide whether or not we're going to say no on Ramon, that's that's an important piece, is the transitional housing. To me, actually, that's a more important piece. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't say we couldn't do any, but you would be severely limited on the number that you could do there. And I, I think the challenge with, um, uh, and again, not to just negate any property outside of McCarthy, but the, the challenge is the design within that structure on Ramon, uh, I believe would be more costly because you're going to have to do not only the shelter aspect of it, but with uh, such on the site of McCarthy or if you built from the ground, you've got the ability to utilize certain structures or build structures that have a more dedicated facility towards medical and wraparound services outside of the shelter concept um, as well as separate cafeteria and all that. What you're trying to do is not create an environment where individuals that are transitioning out of the shelter um, feel uncomfortable about having to utilize services within that structure system, if that makes any sense. Uh, Council Member Garner. Thank you. Um, sorry, Greg, I am just going to put it out there. I, I, I am finding that this whole presentation is really pushing the McCarthy site. And I, I really thought we were having a conversation about what the best site would be. Um, I'm sorry, I just I just need to state it because I, I think um, it's something that the public is is probably thinking too. I don't think it's just me. Um, but but in terms of 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 this location that we're just they're talking about right now, um, it's just across the way from the empty land that we're also discussing um, as an option. So for me, that's another part of why this property were it to be available, as, as Mayor Pro Tem said, is attractive because you literally can create the transitional housing right there across the street as an extension of um, this project, which is actually very similar to what is being proposed at the McCarthy site. Um, there, the proposal is that there's land there that could potentially be purchased to build transitional housing on as well. So um, it, it, I, I just think that there are a lot of opportunities here in terms of um, really having robust access to things and social security is right here um, and not and not being so far away from so many of the services that that we need. But again, like it, it would be it's immensely helpful to know if this is would actually be an option or not. All right. Yeah, and if I could just briefly, Mayor Pro Tem and Council Member Gardner, uh, you're exactly right that we did not spend as much time with conceptual layout and some of those things for this alternative because we did not um, think it's available. So it was really primarily used for comparative purposes to try to put in context the parcel uh, that we do or the, the property that we do see as available. So um, we could certainly get answers to the questions about whether it might become available, but um, we, we didn't study it as closely because it did not appear to be an option. And, and still doesn't until we learn that maybe it falls out of contract or something like that. Thank you. Uh, are there other questions, comments with, with regard to the Ramon site? 
if I could offer a suggestion to uh, my colleagues uh, that we ask staff to do uh, the due diligence to determine whether or not uh, uh, the Ramon site is, uh, is potentially viable in terms of uh, coming back on uh, to the market and report that back to us, but uh, notwithstanding some reason to believe that uh, uh, this site is going to become available, that we move on from it. Mayor Pro Tem and Council, I do think we can do that. One of the things you might want to do, especially given some of the time constraints for the McCarthy property, is um, at the conclusion of this evening's conversation, you may consider tabling this item until the next meeting. So uh, ironically, because we have a meeting next week, the agenda materials are already going out for that meeting. But by tabling this, you, we would essentially amend that agenda on Monday morning add this item again and, and try to resolve that one issue um, if, if that's in fact still in consideration at the end of this conversation. Is that, uh, is that something that works for everyone else? I see head shaking. I don't think this is the appropriate time for, unless city clerk or our attorney corrects me, uh, for us to be voting on that. But uh, I, I'm seeing some sense of consensus on that. All right. Uh, for the uh, city attorney, is it appropriate for us to uh, bring the mayor back into the room and into the discussion as we now move forward away from 4775 East Vermont? Yes, it would. Okay, good. Madam Mayor, welcome back. Uh, would you like to take over the discussion at this point? If you want to proceed and lead this whole item, that would be great. Madam Mayor, welcome back. Uh, and I will go ahead and complete uh, this one and be happy to give it back to you when we're finished. Uh, so with that issue now set aside, uh, let's move on to a further discussion regarding uh, the other alternatives uh, that we have before us. Uh, an existing uh, building uh, that would be refurbished uh, versus versus uh, other sites that uh, would be new construction. Uh, are there questions or comments from council? Council member Garner. Um, I mostly have comments and I wanted to just share a little bit of, of information um, because, well, actually pretty much all of the sites are in District 1, <laughs> which I just wanted to put out there, uh, which I don't, I don't think is a, a bad thing. I just wanted to um, be clear about that because in my district boundaries can be a little bit difficult for people to, to know where things are. Um, I, so I had a meeting on Monday with my residents. It was not intended to be about this, but uh, much like uh, happens when there's some big topic. It, it of course, um, so there's a lot of time spent on that. And um, overall, residents were were very concerned about the location. Some of the the comments um, are are ones that I think were. I, I will let me share with you the comments that I thought are relevant to us in this conversation. Are most relevant to this conversation. Um, one was that there was interest from residents um, of, that the city have an objective criteria in how we select um, a site for a navigation center um, in similar vein that we do for CUPs or other things. Um, and the reason this was brought up was because they said, you know, there's pushback no matter where you put something, um, but they were interested in being able to say, you know, objectively, here is really the best location and this is um, why we're doing this here, which I thought was a really um, interesting thought and um, something worthy of mentioning. The other thing that um, was, was raised was just a concern about making sure that we were in contact with 
um, the Desert Healthcare District. So I did reach out to the Desert Healthcare District, but it was obviously really short notice. So we haven't had a chance to have a, a larger conversation about this site. Um, the, the Healthcare District just recently um, gave money to open a mobile health clinic in the Desert Highlands Gateway Estates neighborhood because it, it doesn't have access to any medical care um, over there. So I thought that was something that was worth also discussing. And then just a few other notes that I are a combination of things that residents said and also just my experience. And for the record, I, I do live very close to this property, but I'm, I am um, well outside a thousand feet of the location, which is why I can still participate on this. Um, one of the things that was mentioned is the, the bus lines and um, there is a bus line that is probably a 15 minute walk to the nearest bus stop on, on either side. Um, but it is pretty slow. So the bus, our sun line, I know we're working on it, but the sun lines uh, comes about every 40 minutes at this, at this time. So it is, um, it isn't that much. And I also just wanted to point out that there's one restaurant that's in walking distance. Uh, I know the staff report kind of made it sound like there were multiple. There's not. Um, I wish there were, that would be great, but there's not. Um, and so we don't have a lot of resources that are that are close by here. There's um, a lot of housing, but there's there's just not a whole lot of, of other services um, in this area. And that was one of my my biggest concerns. And so while I, I like the idea that there's this building that we could rehab and that there's empty land and all of that, my concern still remains with um, those other resources, with the difficulty in getting to a grocery store, the difficulty in getting to the social security office. And then again, that transitional piece. If we're hoping that people will be able to transition um, out of homelessness and be able to start working, um, then I feel like they should be in very, very close, if not walking distance to um, an abundance of jobs. And that's why I think the properties on you know, Ramon and Giannotri are so compelling because of their um, people's ability to literally walk to, to a job um, and to the social security office. Um, the other part I wanted to mention about, about that is, um, shoot, now I'm <laughs> forgetting it. Um, darn. If I can interrupt, I'm so sorry, yeah. Councilmember Garner. Um, since you are still talking in general, including the Ramon pro Oh no, not that Ramon property. Okay, I just want to be clear. Um, I think I still feel uncomfortable that this is a general discussion and I'd like to um, be recused um, just out of the abundance of caution if I can. Okay. Um, so city attorney, do I have to be out of the Zoom room or can I... Um, come in, sit here off screen and come in once it's not a general conversation? Um, if you're going to recuse, I would, I would recommend just to step out of the Zoom room until, until this agenda item is, is over. Can we just get some clarification, though? Because I thought we were going to have a general discussion with the mayor. Because I'm we, not talking we, at all about we, the property that's recused. Legally, we can. It's my understanding that she wants to do this in a, in abundance of caution. Okay. Okay. Well, sorry, Mayor. I no. I'm so <laughs> sorry. I want to participate. Um, since council left um, that other property, just kind of didn't make a decision on it, and it's still under as an option. I think I should not be part of the conversation right now. Okay. Okay, sorry. I just I I'd like to have you <laughs> involved. So okay, city city attorney, am I required to recuse right now? I do not believe you're required to be recused right now. Okay, thank you. Then I will stay at the request of my counsel and sit here. <sighs> thank you for continuing to participate. Um, and, and and yes, just just to be abundantly clear, when I'm when I say the Ramon property from from this point forward, I, I am talking about that piece of empty land. I'm not talking about um, the other property. Um, thank you for <laughs> for making sure that I'm I'm clear on that as well. Um, I think I think I'll just wait then on that because I know I did have another point that I um, I kind of lost, and I've been talking for a long time anyway. All right. 
Thank you, Councilmember Garner, and we will come back to you, I know. Uh, other co questions, comments? Councilmember Kors. Sure, um, thank you. Um, so a couple things, one, I think finding a, a site that can be up and running faster is really important. We're in a true crisis moment. Um, whether, regardless of which one of those sites or if there are others where there's buildings that we can get up and running, I, you know, in potentially a year versus two or three on vacant land, to me is just a high priority. I think our community feels the crisis. We all can feel the crisis. Um, and the people who have no place to go feel the crisis. Um, so very much understand, you know, wanting this to be in a place that has services and um, this is where I could use some more help from sort of the experts uh, on the timing if we did the vacant Ramon property, right? I, I, is that in the same shape as Gene Autry where it's from scratch? Uh, is that, I'm trying to just get a sense on, on the, these pieces. Um, and then if we've done any outreach on the property on Gene Autry where there are leases, you know, whether there's the ability to um, talk to those tenants, have we done that? And then whether those locations are better um, for the reasons that make sense to me that Council Member Garner raised, um, then the McCarthy property, and I asked that other question earlier, how does the size factor in to be able to do the transitional housing with modular units or pallet homes or whatever it is, to get more people into actual transitional housing as soon as possible. I know that was a lot. I just could use some more information from the experts on those points. And I think we all could, and I think the public would appreciate that as well. I'm not sure who I'm asking that, so I'll ask the city manager who, who the best person to answer those questions is. Yeah, I, I think we can, uh, Jay can help provide um, some context you know, when when we saw locations, for instance, where there were current leases, we we really didn't look into those um, because, again, they just don't appear to be available. So, if if council is interested in those, um, and just noting that you know dealing with multiple tenants with multiple leases, really objectively, that that appears to me not available, at least not immediately, but, but maybe in the future. So we could go down the path of something like inquiring with each one of them if there were opportunities for buyout or, or something like that. But um, those kind of criteria to, to consider a property in that condition uh, available may even open it up to, to others. But it, it seems a little more of a long shot, to be honest, uh -huh. than looking at, say, vacant parcels um, or, or parcels that are ready to build. Um, so again, we just might want to get some clarification. Uh, that also, that kind of due diligence could take a little more time than just inquiring about properties that may or may not be under contract or something like that. So you know, we can pursue some of that, but that's, that's probably the caveat. Thank you. And then on, you know, in looking at having sort of the navigation center piece plus um, significant, you know, numbers of tra transitional housing, which we know are needed uh, to get people actually off the streets. Um, how much land do we have? So we have this, if we look at McCarthy, it's right 3.64 acres, I think, when I just looked at the staff report. And the design of it seems like we're using all the space. So I know we have our Gene Autry property is bigger. Some of these are smaller. Is that sort of a minimum amount of space we need? I'm just trying to get a sense as we're trying to compare these, because they're not really apples to apples properties. Um, how much, how much acreage we think we need to do this right uh, to get the transitional units plus the medical services and the other pieces. So should we, are we looking at at least three acres, four acres, or is two acres enough? That's, that would be helpful. And how does that, where's the funding coming in, right? If we bifurcated this to just the navigation center, shelter beds without the housing, does that impact funding? I'm sorry, I just have a lot of questions um, in trying to make as much an informed direction, I guess, is what we're doing tonight, but decision is possible. So, Councilman records ideally, if, if to have the element of shelter beds, to have the wraparound services, 
um, and you know a sufficient amount of housing, you're probably looking at 3.5 to 4 acres at a minimum. Um, I, I will tell you, as you look at funding streams of Home Key, HAP3, um, the governor has made it very clear that in order, they, they will not fund just a shelter system, even if that includes wraparound services. There are no options uh, for that. There has to be some element of housing when it comes to both Home Key and HAP. Okay, thank you. That, that is helpful. And then staff from a timing purpose of something with buildings and something without, such as our Eugene Archery property, just not to confuse vacant lands with um, that are both on remote. I know we have a Gene Autry property that's I think five plus acres. So how long would that take versus let's just say the McCarthy for purpose of this discussion or any site that has buildings that work? So the estimated construction time frame is 24 months, but since that particular property is, when the, is within the county's airport land use committee, uh, we've been told that may add an additional two months. So a total time frame for vacant Gene Autry parcel is uh, 26 months. Whereas for the, um, uh, the, the, the build out timeframe for uh, renovation rehab uh, on say the McCarthy or other uh, properties is um, 12 months. So it's, um, it's about half the time frame. And you have the cost outlaid, so I, I have that already. Okay, thank you. Those were my questions, Mayor Pro. Uh, other questions or comments? Uh, any other questions or comments? Uh, I'm sorry, Council Member Garner. No worries. Um, and I, I, <laughs> I, I have too many com comments, and I, I wish I was more like Mayor Pro Tem, who is good about putting things down on paper first. Um, one question that I had is kind of what is the best approach um, for reaching out to people who are in different circumstances, right? Like we often, oftentimes when we get complaints um, or concerns from the city, it's about um, people who um, might have um, mental health issues or drug addiction issues and who are very visible um, on the street. Um, we don't often hear people talking about, um, you know, families that are living in their car, which we also have in our city, right? So if someone can tell me who's a provider, um, are there different approaches for handling um, different, different types of people in different types of circumstances? And, and how does that work with um, a navigation center like this? I'm sorry, just one minute while we um, try to get this mic live. Well, one thing I'll add as we're just working on getting that done is, um, and this speaks to the size issue and especially some of the need to scale um, and possibly scale up, is that there is a relationship certainly with our ability to provide shelter and some of the other policies that we might have dealing with some of the secondary impact. So when it comes to, say, um, rules that might prohibit camping outside or something like that, I think the basis of uh, the court precedent that limits some of those rules is not providing an alternative. So if we have sufficient space available, it does enable us to reach some of the populations that are um, perhaps more resistant and, and um, create a, an incentive not only does it deal with some of the secondary impacts and prohibit some of the activity, but it creates the incentive to move in the direction of services um, because really it might be one of the only alternatives left if you can have stricter rules for you know, camping outside and, and collection and carrying of wares and things like that. Um, and I'll turn it over to Greg to deal um, with more of the uh, service provider element. 
I was going to say that's a, that's a great point, Justin, and I was going to address that at the end of my comments. But um, and and I've had this conversation with Palm Springs Police Departments is that they there are people that they encounter that seem like our most hard to deal with individuals that are homeless, um, but they don't want to go to Indio for a shelter aspect. So if we did have some element here in the city, some of them would use that. But more specifically, Councilwoman Gardner, to answer your question is there you know no one homeless person um, is the same and everybody has their own unique situation and I know you understand that um, but to your point about you know the woman who is in a car with her kids um, I, I can literally take you I or tell you I take two to three calls of these personally every week that and that's in addition to CVAC to Martha's to CVRM um, and we find some of them housing but we just don't have enough and not necessarily the shelter beds and I think that's that's what's great about a campus environment um, is the ability for us to have some transitional units, whether those are the crisis stabilization units or more permanent supportive housing units. What's more important though there is almost every single homeless individual, whether it's someone in a car, chronic on the street with a, with a grocery basket, couch surfing, they need some type of service, whether that's behavioral health services, substance use services, job development. And if you've got those services in a centralized location, our ability to manage more clients is much easier than if they're scattered about. Um, our ability to keep those clients engaged is far greater as well. When we know that they're literally only 500 feet away from our behavioral health office or away from our medical clinic or our workforce development, it's so much easier. You know, one of the largest staff costs for homeless services is case management. And I think we all know that in government too, whether it's government or nonprofit, our highest costs are staff costs. So, so the more that we can... Um, uh, that's what I want to say. The more that we can utilize one case manager for more cases, uh, the less costly it is, but the more successful it is as well. I hope that kind of answered the question. So, so, so there's there's not necessarily a different way. It's just about having other resources available, which is fine. I just I just wanted to understand if there yeah, was and, and, multiple and I, ways that and, we go about doing this. And, and there are multiple ways. So I mean, I okay. can list you probably at least six different programs within the county that will address either seniors, uh, families. Um, you mm -hmm. know, domestic violence victims, um, and then obviously our service providers provide that too. So there is a multiple of resources. I think where we lack, I don't think, I know where we lack in the western part of the valley is the facility to do this. And, you know, even um, Justin and I, as I mentioned, he, you know, he's been convening these, uh, I think once a month, Justin, or sometimes more than that, um, with partners. And, and we were really talking in our last meeting a few days ago um, about the need for what's being called as the new term terminology now, which I really, really love, but it's called integrated service delivery. And it's about how are we really convening partners throughout the homeless spectrum, and that's government, nonprofit, business leaders in, but how do we not only just get together and talk about what the problems are, but how do we case manage individual people that we know of? So say Captain Kovalov brings me an individual, and how do we all sit around a table and work? What the beauty of having an actual campus environment, and again, I'm not picking one location, just overall campus environment, is that you've got actually a space that we can do that convening as partners, but more importantly, it's a space that we could have somebody that we all are working with, whether that's two, three, four, or five agencies, but again, we have that access to that individual. That's some of the biggest challenges for homeless service providers is that mm -hmm. we may identify someone that's still not ready to go into full services, um, but we're engaged with them, but then sometimes we can't find them and we'll lose them and then they spiral further in. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I just wanted to understand the, you know, if there was a need for a different type of site for different types of people, that, that makes sense. So that's, that's clear for me. Um, if I can continue, Mayor Pratam. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, the other thing that I wanted to just raise up because I, I it was new to me and I don't know how familiar um, others are are with this program is um, there's a program called True Evolution in Riverside and it actually focuses on um, the LGBTQ community and those living with um, HIV. 
but um, it, it also serves others as well, but that's kind of how it started. And I just saw a presentation um, on this, the Brothers of the Desert held it just a couple of days ago. Um, and they're actually building a site that's very pretty much a navigation center um, in, in Riverside. And one of the things that um, they were talking about was that access to services, right? They were like, the library is close by, the grocery stores across the street. They were talking about their site location um, and, and the site location specifically um, was good because of these services that were nearby it already. Um, and that was something that they really stressed. Um, and it, it, it was the, quite the powerhouse of a presentation. I was truly blown away by the work that um, that was being done there. Um, and I would love for us to reach out um, as, a, as a city to chat with him more. I think his name is Gabriel, uh, and I'm, I'm blanking on his last name. Um, but um, I did want to just put that out there for, for, for council members to, to look at. Um, the other um, thing that I wanted to ask about is that extension of our property, uh, the property next to the boxing club. And one of the reasons that I'm also really pushing this conversation to be broader is, is um, because I feel like we, we, well, I, at least I would really like to see us um, do something that is um, innovative and good and, and really ticks off the boxes that we have. And so my question is, you know, do we have the ability to use that land that's next to the boxing club to set up, you know, the pallet homes or other kind of transitional spaces and extension of this campus that we currently have, even though it's small, um, while we were to build a more permanent facility. And, and again, while I, I really value the idea of having this building um, that is already in existence, um, if we have another location that is closer to all of these different services, then I like the idea of being able to use that money um, to focus on that area um, instead of putting some money into this area and then later moving on to this other area um, down the line, um, especially if we have the ability um, to extend where we are right now. So just wanted to ask about that. Council Member Garner, I'd need to turn to um, Jay or possibly Greg to talk about sources of funding and how they might be applied. But um, with that piece of the conversation notwithstanding, I do think we have the ability to implement, you know, short-term, temporary, bridge-type um, programs. So there, there aren't many limitations to that other than, of course, total costs, right? So anything that we do for a year or two um, that, that we roll up at the end of that year or two is, is funds that, that don't continue to work for us long term. And, and again, um, probably want to be thoughtful about what sources might be available for those kinds of facilities. Um, but we do have the opportunity to look at bridge type solutions in the event that we're on an expedited path to build a navigation center or one that might take a little longer. Can I add that onto that, Justin? Um, that, um, and I'm familiar with the True Revolution project, uh, uh, Councilwoman Gardner, and it is an amazing project. Um, how they were able to qualify for home key funding and other funding is because they had structures on there that they were able to rehabilitate. They weren't going from the ground up. Ideally, I agree with you. If we had all those amenities, it, it would be ideal. I, I don't think we're talking about amenities that are, are too far away. Additionally, I think, I don't think, as we see projects like the Miralon, as we see maybe Skyview come in, as we see more affordable housing projects in the area, you're going to have a greater density population, which is going to attract more of those amenities that haven't been coming in because they've done the studies that there's not enough population. So I, I do see that coming down the road. I, I really want to emphasize, too, about where we're at when it comes to funding. And one new build is twice twice as much as what it will be to renovate. Two, it takes twice as long, and under home key, HAP, we have timelines that we have to meet um, as far as when that money has to be spent down. Um, and um, I almost would, and you know, Mitch from Lasar may be able to help me on this, but I would almost guarantee you a new bill from the ground up, I will not be able to get home key funding from. It really has to be some type of rehabilitation uh, slash modular type product.
Council Member Garner have, is that uh, your, your comments and questions for now? Yes, actually, um, Greg, can you clarify when you said a modular? Because I thought that at one point there was a presentation that was done that talked about putting a modular um, building for the navigation center on the Giannotri property. Yes, so can you so clarify? There, yeah, and, um, and unfortunately that company um, is no longer doing that. I think they were a little, um, I don't want to use the word aggressive, I think a little hopeful in what they could be able to accomplish and did not have the capacity to do that. With that being said though, um, especially because they were looking at really being building a large structure, where if you look at the real successful and modular companies now that are doing, you know, either your transitional units or permanent supportive housing units, whether that's container uh, renovations or actual modular, um, I've visited a couple of these manufacturers in Southern California California. Um, and so there are companies that can do that. But on a grander building like that, there are companies that can do that, but your timeline and your costs are greater. But for the individual housing, um, the nice thing about those is they would qualify under a home key because there's like an eight to 10 month uh, time frame that you have to get something uh, built and then somebody into. Okay, thank you. And, and the reason I mentioned this is because I'm at one point, and again, I don't remember when this presentation was, there was discussion about how it was um, using these new modular materials um, are sturdier and uh, like fire resistant and wind resistant yeah. and, and go up faster. And so I'm just curious about, you know, if there's home key funding for doing a project like that, that would actually cut down our cost, you know, why not do that? But well, is that, so is that not an option anymore? No, ab absolutely not. And I would argue that should be an option for the transitional and permanent supportive housing units on, on whatever site you would choose. Um, because, okay. because they are available, they are very safe, um, they're easily to construct off site. Um, your ability to do infrastructure to them is relatively easier than say a stick built. Um, so I absolutely agree that um, that should be an element of, the, of this, wherever that would be. Okay, so then if we were to do that type of build on a vacant lot, would that uh, would we be able to get home key funding? I, I believe so, and I, and um, w what I would envision, Councilwoman Gardner, is that it, this project basically you would look at it in much of a phased approach. It doesn't mean that you can't go on dual tracks, but you know, say you've got a, a building, no matter where it's located, that you would do the renovation part for the shelter wraparound services. I think we can proceed with that uh, quicker. Um, could actually probably qualify for some home key funding for that as long as we're planning a housing element side to that. Um, but then again, is go after, uh, you know, in, in a concurrent phase or, you know, slightly delayed phase, home key funding for um, a manufactured type housing site. And, um, you know, ideally, again, uh, you know, everything's about scoring when you're applying and competing for funding. And so if you can co-locate, especially transitional units and maybe a few permanent units um, close to that navigation center, your, L, your, your scoring is going to be much better when it comes to the competitive nature. I think that's, I don't think, I know for a fact that's why True Evolution was so successful in getting not only home key funding, but I believe they got some um, ESG, Emergency Solutions Grant, sorry for the uh, acronym again, uh, funding as well on that because of the co-location area. Thank you. That's it, Mayor Pro Tem. Okay, thank you. And Mayor Pro Tem and Council, if I could, um, we have gotten some information. Staff's been made aware that the um, property at 4775 Ramon Road has fallen out of escrow, so it does appear that it may be available. The, the caveat for this evening's conversation is still that um, we haven't performed a lot of due diligence on at that location, uh, thinking that it was not available. So I think still it's probably a good idea for Council to uh, be a little more exhaustive in looking at the other um, sites and directing staff to do any follow-up due diligence. Um, and that could include, of course, uh, looking a little more closely at that location. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, City Manager. Uh, Council Member Woods? Did I uh, go up? Or, uh, uh, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, just for those in the public that have gotten a little bit lost, I think the fundamental question, the first question is, do we want a navigation campus in the city of Palm Springs? And two years ago, um, when I first came on council, um, Barbara Popey, you know, basically directed us that that in transitional housing was something that we wanted and something we should spend our, our money on, the grant that we got. And I also believe, just in listening to the, the council overall, that 
the council and the community both are in support of a navigation campus here in the city of Palm Springs. So with that in mind, the, we as a city were offered an opportunity to purchase a particular site, and that was on McCarthy Road. And before we went any further, it was I that said we needed to investigate all our opportunities before we just put all our eggs in one basket, and whatever our opportunities that are out there. And that's exactly what this staff report is doing. The staff report is saying you've got all these opportunities besides the opportunity that was given to you um, up front. But when we make this decision, we're really talking about there's several factors that I think I've heard council and myself will be looking at. One is the speed and timing by which something can actually happen. Another one is the money and funding that's both for the capital improvement, the purchase, the capital improvement and the long term um, operation. So it was great to hear the county say about Cal AIM and the opportunity to use uh, Medi-Cal money to pay for some of it. We're also looking at a location where it's near services and whatnot. So I think what we found out is there's some money available. There's some funding. Maybe there's still a little gap to be filled, but on the particular site that was mentioned that we were offered the opportunity on McCarthy, there is funding available. It offers good speed and good timing, uh, if that's what we indeed want. And its location is not the best compared to some of the other sites, but it's fairly good. My first choice was always the lot on Gene Autry behind the Home Depot Center, behind Aldi Food. And that had always been my choice for the last two years. However, I wasn't offered this opportunity that we have before us on, on Carthy Road. Um, so it kind of throws a little wrench into that uh, because we probably can't build out the site on um, Gene Autry in a cost-effective, speedy manner. And it seems to be better closer to location services. So that's kind of where I'm landing with the whole thing. Um, and it, it, it's not cost effective to do that site. Um, so that site is, is out of the question when you, when you do comparative analysis on it. But I think we definitely do want this. I think a lot of the discussion that we've had are on some of the, the reasons we need it, why we need it, how we would operate. You know, and I think all of us are in agreement that we do. So I think tonight we really have to provide direction on do we want to pursue the opportunity that was before us or do we want more information on some of the alternatives and should we limit some of those alternatives to a few so the staff is not overwhelmed um, if we continue the conversation between now and next week. All right, thank you. Uh, Council Member Kors. Great, uh, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, I do think that I appreciate uh, Councilmember Woods. You know, there was that fundamental question: Do we want a navigation center? And I fully support a navigation center with transitional housing. Um, my my inclination is, um, and I really appreciate all the work staff has done, and Greg, you have done uh, to really get such a thorough staff report uh, and presentation. I think what for me would be the best way forward would be to look at the Ramon property that um, is now available that wasn't we didn't know was available um, and the McCarthy property um, and bring those back as to right how many people can can we do transitional housing what the cost would be what the funding that's available from the state and county in addition to the three million dollars we set aside for this kind of project for the Ivy Palm and we held uh, and really get that analysis, looking at the services. You know, there are pros, can be pros and cons to both, but I think if that worked for staff to get, to limit it to those two, in my view, I think given the cost issues and the timing issues, I think we should do something that we can do quickly at a price point that we, we can do. And as far as the Gene Autry property, which I've always um, uh, shared uh, wanting to do something on, I think really going out to affordable housing developers um, who can get federal matching grants and all of that, if we donate the land to that, um, will also get us you know, more affordable housing that we'll need as people transition out of um, other, other things that we need, worker housing in our city desperately. And I'd like to see that site used 
for that, the Gene Autry site used for that kind of housing and really go out and try and talk to all the affordable housing developers about potentially doing that. And if that takes a couple of years, that's what they take. We know that from the Monarch, that's been five years um, from the groundbreaking that happened today. But I do think the two sites, and now that we have a second site, that have pros and cons and really getting that analysis and bring that back. And I don't know if next Thursday is doable or we need to have a special meeting given the time considerations we have on one of them. Um, that, you know, get that input from the city manager if that's where council leans to be. But that would, that would be my recommendation that we actually now get a little more analysis on the Ramon property given that wasn't done understandably because it was in contract at the time. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I would second that if that was a motion. Sure. I don't know if we need a motion or direction, but um, either way, I'm good with. Yeah. If I could add, just ask just a couple of questions. I think we are getting close to a resolution on this. Uh, uh, the uh, site at uh, McCarthy, as I understood it, uh, had the potential of perhaps being up to a hundred. Uh, uh, beds or being able to accommodate a hundred people. Is, is that correct? So um, that would be very tight as far as shelter beds go. I, I think it, depending on the, you know, the layout of the housing, that's more of the hundred number I was in there. I think you're looking at in order, <laughs> we have to be careful again too, because of the funding streams here on congregate versus non-congregate shelter. Um, again, we're looking at, um, really what is the easiest way to get somebody into services and and a lot of congregate shelter type settings people are afraid of especially when it comes to women and we have a lot of senior uh, women and and even middle-aged women um, that are on our streets so you're probably looking at about I, I would say realistically probably 50 to 75 beds keep in mind too is we are having a little bit of element of some family type uh, elements in there too so that we can accommodate that um, uh, but then on the on the housing street Structure. And again, Council uh, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton, it, it really depends on your layout and your structure. Yeah, and, and Go ahead. It, if I could just briefly, um, certainly we can try to go back even um, in the span of a week and try to not really accomplish conceptual level design work, but try to work with numbers for space. The one thing that will just be what it is, is it really is worth emphasizing again the difference between a two acre parcel and a three more than three and a half acre parcel and when you look at the conceptual layout of the three and a half acre parcel it takes advantage of some of that space not only for some of those modular or pod type units but for some of the other amenities that we think are needed now and perhaps in the future so um, you know playground space um, child care is a key component to certainly the operation of Martha's Village and Kitchen at the facility in Indio um, so it's not to say that it couldn't work, but if we're thinking about the needs now and we've occupied a good, you know, almost all of that three and a half acre space at a conceptual level and any other kind of growth or any other collaboration opportunities for other services like we've talked about behavioral health or, or, or you know, similar, that's just a pretty significant difference be between the two parcels and their ability to serve as a kind of co-located service campus center type um, environment. So we will go back and look at the numbers, but we but we will always be looking at two acres versus 3.6, and that's just going to really limit the opportunities um, at the Ramon site. Thank you. Thank you, and I get that, and I appreciate uh, that. Uh, my next question following that, though, is do we have any sense of how many beds we actually need in Palm Springs? Wow. That's a million million dollar question. <laughs> um, I, I, I thought it may be, but you know, I, I, I think the best way to look at this, Mayor Pro Tem, is um, to look at what the demand level has been over the last three summers. I think is a good barometer of that. Um, you know, when we did the boxing club, we started about 40, 45 beds. Um, we really roughly. I, Overall, just in my numbers, and Jay, you may be able to correct me on this, but it's, it's really been an average of about 35 to 40 that are kind of full time. 
I think there is a higher demand if you had a different facility is the thing. And obviously, if you're looking at a 24-hour operation instead of just a place to lay your head at night, um, uh, if you engage people more. I don't want to get too much on a tangent here, but the county has a really, really good, when it comes to substance use program, peer-to-peer -peer program. And what you're seeing is facilities like Martha's and CVRM are taking that kind of model and using that in homeless services. So if we get somebody through this type of system, you get those people into employment out on a peer-to-peer -peer structure, I believe you attract more people. I, I would go back, too, is that there is a big challenge um, for law enforcement here to not that does not have a facility. So I think our throughput would, would be greater. It's just really hard, depending, to put a real solid number, because to Councilwoman Gardner's point, too, is it, it's just every situation is so different. You know, someone may only need it for two nights, where, you know, someone may need it for longer. I know that was a long-winded answer to that question, but. Well, lots of it. And I, I'm going to try to give a pretty short answer to what I think I heard. Uh, we're not quite sure what our, uh, the demand is going to be. Uh, and all of us would be abundantly thrilled if one facility uh, was adequate to uh, cover what uh, the demand is. But uh, we don't know that that's going to be the case. So uh, money is, uh, uh, we don't have unlimited resources, uh, but uh, no matter what we do, we're, we're doing our best to hope we are addressing the demand uh, with whatever facility we build first. Uh, question for uh, city manager uh, uh, and city attorney. Do we need a motion and a vote to concentrate on two locations and have you come back uh, and make a presentation or do we just simply table this uh, for further discussion? Is one and two, uh, how much time do you need to be able to come back and give us a uh, thorough review of the two sites? So uh, I think direction is sufficient, but to the extent that that direction is specific and limits some of our analysis, that is helpful because I do think we want to be expeditious. The opportunity, at least at the McCarthy property, is not one that is guaranteed to last forever. So um, the, if the city were to assume the current purchase contract, we're really uh, dealing with a clock issue. Um, there may be some opportunities to extend that, but again, that would likely come at a cost. So I think one way or the other, we'd be looking to bring you any information we can get by next Thursday, um, just just to facilitate that as best we can. And then if we still didn't have enough, we would extend. By the time we get into December, given the, what we would want to do for public outreach and process from there, um, it starts to get more and more difficult for the McCarthy site. And we, we risk losing that opportunity, which isn't the end of the world if, if council's not confident in moving forward with that. But um, just want to be honest about that. And then I think Jay might have a little bit more information um, to address a previous question. Uh, we do have a report from September from the Palm Springs Access Center where it was reported that 247 unduplicated individuals were served. So that might lend uh, to the total number of beds needed. I would also add our last point in time count was 187 individuals. Okay, thank you. That really helps. Um, so. Uh, do we, uh, city attorney, do we table this discussion or do we need to take a vote? Uh, you do not need to take a vote if you get, give us general d direction to continue this to the November 4th meeting. Um, again, as the city manager indicated with some, maybe some direction as to which uh, properties that would be sufficient. Okay. Uh, is the uh, council member Woods? Um, you know, a lot of arrows seem to be pointing towards the McCarthy property when we look at the criteria that we're trying to base it on, um, especially if we want an ambitious program that's going to serve um, the, the population that we have and any future population. The only concern I have about any any alternative that we take, but particularly the McCarthy property, because we have to enter into escrow rather, relatively quickly, is that there is a funding gap still that still exists. And I would want to know how we would fulfill that funding gap or what opportunities there are before we go into escrow, if that was the chosen property. Uh, 
I think that's a, a very valid question and a very valid issue. Uh, so, is there... Mayor uh, Pro Tem? Mm -hmm, please. If I could make a quick announcement. For those who are watching on Channel 17, there appears to be uh, an interruption. Uh, you can watch our live broadcast on our website, uh, www. Uh, palmspringca.gov forward slash PSC TV or on our YouTube channel. Uh, thank you. So uh, is there anyone who wants to argue that we should be looking at sites other than uh, the uh, McCarthy and the Ramon uh, site uh, for refurbishing at this point? Go ahead, Council Member Garner. I wanted to raise this because, again, another resident raised this, and I thought it was such a good idea, but I hear there might be issues. Um, the Desert Sun Building. <laughs> Truly. I mean, it's huge, and it's in a great location. <laughs> I had not thought of that, but uh, that, that is a potential. I think it's... The price, I think, you know, when you look at the, I think if, if I remember reading the Desert Sun article on the building, uh, it was a high price point. Um, I think probably double what we're looking at, but we can. No, it's, it's listed for, it's listed for the same as the other properties. Oh, is it really? Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was like double, I thought, when I read the article. No, but I hear there might be logistical issues, but it, if it's something that we can at least assess, that would be amazing. Uh, staff, what's the uh, capacity to assess that uh, that property? It, to, to be honest, I think we're going to be somewhat limited in, in assessing a number of parcels, at least in a timely fashion. What council really may need to decide in the course of the next couple of meetings is whether or not you think the McCarthy parcel has enough potential to pursue. If not, I think what that means is we likely lose the opportunity at least to assume the current purchase contract. And at that point, the, the good news is um, we have more time. The bad news is we may lose an opportunity that in many ways, when staff discovered it, um, really does seem ideal. Um, that's not to say there aren't others, but, but the consequence of being exhaustive and really wanting to have um, greater assurance that we have the absolute right um, site would be that we may lose an opportunity. Um, that That's just the reality of, of real estate regardless. So um, I think we can bring you anything we can in, at the very next meeting and the one after that, November 4th and November 18th. Um, by the time we get that far, uh, we probably either have enough confidence to move forward with one of those or we're taking our time to, to vet the others. Uh, Council Member Coors. Great, thank you. Um, I know the um, Councilmember Garner is right. It was on the market initially for that, and someone bought it. I don't know if they've done work, but they put it on as far as September 3rd for $12.9 million, but are also considering keeping it and leasing it since it's half office and half warehouse. So um, now if they bought it for 5 or $6 million and they're trying to sell it for thirteen, they may take an offer for less, of course, but just wanted to um, share that. But it was on for that initially as well. That's what I had remembered, too. Uh, that it was on for a lower price. But now it's, according to the Desert Sun, September 3rd, it's 12.9. So, uh, do we have uh, consensus to ask staff to come back to us uh, next uh, Thursday uh, with a report on the uh, uh, 4775 East Ramon uh, site for refurbishing and uh, the 3589 McCarthy site for refurbishing and give us as much comparison as they can of the potentials of both of those sites. Uh, and we will then make a decision potentially uh, next Thursday evening. I'm good with that. You see two heads, two heads shaking, three? Okay. Then, uh, staff, I th do you have the direction you need to uh, allow us to table this uh, for conclusion, hopefully next Thursday evening? Yes, we will do the best we can in the short time frame to bring you as much information as, as we can get. That sounds wonderful. 
we've been at this for a while. It's uh, 10 to 9. Can we take a 10-minute uh, break uh, till 9 p.m. and uh, allow the mayor then to return and take over?
everybody. We'll come back from recess, get started. Thank you to Mayor Pro Tem for leading that last item when I was recused, very much appreciate it. Um, so we're at nine o'clock, um, so we will go to public comment next, but I'd just like to discuss the order of the agenda and check in with council since it's 9 p.m. We have a number of public hearings left um, and then also legislative items. Um, so I might propose, that we, I mean, we can proceed through the public comment and then do public hearings and see where we're at. Um, but I would propose that we at least bump the um, discussion of the climate action plan um, to the next meeting, um, if not any others that are not time sensitive. Uh, probably also the ethics ordinance. Um, is that so city staff, do you need direction now from council bill, which items might be bumped if we have staff sitting on the line waiting? What's your preference? I, I think to the extent you're ready to make that decision, it is um, probably even more than staff or any other stakeholders that might want to participate, say, in the climate action plan. Um, to make that decision now. And I will just add that our agenda is lighter uh, next week. And so for items that can just carry over and, and ultimately be continued, we should have time to get to them. Thank you. I, should, I think we should at least do that for the climate action plan item. Council Member Garner? Uh, I support that. Yep. I think we have time on the next agenda and we can move things. I think that's helpful. So we can get closer to ending at 10 p.m. as we, we try to do, but don't succeed in doing. So if we have the ability to do it by moving some things that aren't time sensitive and staff is good with, we should just move them. Thank you. Um, so can we agree to move the item 3A, introduction of an ordinance for the public integrity ordinance, and then item 5B for the climate action plan? We have consensus there. Okay, sounds like we have consensus. Thank you. And then we will reassess as we get through the public hearing. So the next item is public comment on non-agenda items. This time has been set aside for members of the public to address the city council on items of general interest within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city. Although the city council values your comments pursuant to the Brown Act, uh, it generally cannot take any action on items not listed on the agenda. Two minutes will be assigned to each speaker. City Clerk, if you could please begin contacting speakers by telephone. Brad Anderson, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Brad. I'm sorry, I'm getting a lot of feedback. I don't know if you can hear me or not. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Brad Anderson. I currently live in the city of Ransom Mirage and uh, yeah, this is very disturbing. <laughs> but I wanted to talk about public participation in your meetings. Uh, the um, yeah, this is yeah. I'm getting you know, I got a bad line, I guess. But uh, well, I just want to say that you have uh, events or city council meetings that you can hold in the convention center, or other big forums. So this AB three sixty one that you're abiding by tonight uh, is. Uh, I don't know, smoke and mirrors are on a car because you can adapt your city council and uh, city staff to uh, this social distancing thing, um, which has kind of been debunked anyway. And see, because I can honestly say AB 361 has been abused this evening, and it's a good law, but it's been abused by the city because uh, you're not abiding by it. Uh, uh, my understanding is you had an interruption in your TV channel or something tonight. And under AB 361, the meeting needs to stop. So you need to list that items. And even the call-in uh, process of the meeting that you have is not up to AB 361 standards, meaning that uh, a third party, yes, but the city, no, meaning uh, I should be able to participate live in this meeting without pre-registering and... Uh, well, I can't. I can't participate live without you calling me. So anyway, and the Vector Control District, just so you're aware, uh, there are sterilized mosquito release program where they're thinking about it. 
and they have our new abatement policy, which I'm the only one apparently that knows about all this stuff, but uh, you should really have your uh, trustee report to your city, especially since you last year you had the spring Mr. event. Anderson? So yeah, anyway, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Bruce Hoban, you're live with the Palm Springs City Council, and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Hello, Bruce. Good evening, oh. Mayor, City Council, and members of the Palm Springs City staff. My name is Bruce Hoban. I am the co-founder and currently sit on the board for the Vacation Rental Owners and Neighbors of Palm Springs, also known as VRON. I am here tonight during general comments to ask for your consideration to move the Vacation Rental Compliance Code officers currently in the police department back to the Office of Special Programs where they originated. If you will remember in 2016, for those of you who are around, the city passed by resolution a new permitting fee that increased the fees to $900 at the time. This was done to establish what was then known as the Vacation Rental Compliance Department or now known as the Office of Special Programs. In 2019, during the finance and budget meetings, the budget contained a move for personnel from the Office of Special Programs to the police department. We understand there was a desire that the compliance officers have some type of policing power. However, the numbers of times this has been needed are extremely rare and extraordinary. The Ron believes, as well as some other members of the community who do not appreciate vacation rentals, that code enforcement needs to be moved back. We are requesting council, please either put this as an agenda item on an upcoming meeting or provide guidance from the council to the city manager to make this happen. Thank you very much for your time. Madam Mayor, uh, we were able to reach everybody for public comment, and that concludes public comment for this evening. Thank you. We'll always do this when people allege that we are not following state law and holding our meetings because we take that very seriously. So the attorney, if you could just respond if we're following AB 361 and public meeting laws in this meeting. Yes, certainly. Um, as soon as staff became aware of a um, potential glitch in one of the multiple ways of live streaming our meeting, um, we checked and um, made an announcement to the public of the other two ways of viewing them electronically. And so that complies with AB 361. Thank you. Thank you, City Attorney. I know you also take your role in making sure the city follows um, public access rules very seriously too. So thank you for responding to that. Madam Mayor, Our next, mm -hmm. if I could also add to the, to the statement of um, being able to provide live public comment uh, we did amend our, our first page of the agenda to provide instructions that uh, people can call the city clerk's office at 760-323-8204 um, at any time during the city council meeting um, and add themselves back to uh, the speaker queue. So before a uh, public hearing or public comment period is over, they can continue to call the city clerk's office and we will uh, add them to our queue. Thank you. Thank you, City Clerk. Appreciate your work. I'm trying to make these meetings as accessible as possible, and I think you've um, really gone above and beyond to do so. Um, our next item is item 2A, a review of action taken by the Planning Commission to approve a conditional use permit application by Kings Garden for expansion of an existing cannabis cultivation facility for approximately 38,000 square feet to a 212 212,000 square foot facility and an associated 5,650 square foot warehouse located at 63795 19th Avenue. If we can have a staff report, please. Madam Mayor and members of council, as you'll recall, this item was discussed by the city council back in July, and it's relative to calling forward an action by the planning commission to approve a conditional use permit for the expansion of a cannabis cultivation facility. 
At your meeting on July the 22nd, you uh, did not take any action on the item and you requested that staff follow up on the following two issues. Number one, you requested additional environmental or CEQA review. And then secondly, you also wanted the issues relative to the applicant's Anza Road facility addressed. Uh, in terms of the CEQA analysis that was done, we engaged the city's CEQA consultant to ad do additional review uh, based on information provided by the Sustainability Commission and looking at the actual bills from the existing facility. Uh, we do have the city's CEQA consultant here with us this evening, and I will call her forward after I finish my presentation to have her give you a little bit more information about the, uh, the uh, research that she has done. Uh, one of the things that will assist in this discussion is the applicant back in September via email agreed to use 100% carbon energy, uh, carbon free energy sources for the facility. And so that will assist with any uh, environmental impacts relative to the expansion of the facility. We are proposing that if you take action on this item tonight, that the following additional conditions be included. And these are also in the conditions of approval that are in your packet this evening. Uh, the first condition is that the applicant shall purchase 100% carbon-free power for the 19th Avenue facility, uh, the facility in question that's being expanded. Secondly, the odor control measures at the ANZA facility shall be installed and functioning prior to the issuance of any building permits for the expansion of the 19th Avenue facility. And that also recurring inspections of the ANSA facility be conducted by an independent third party until the odor issues are resolved. Again, these conditions are in your packet in the conditions of approval that are included with that. Uh, so that concludes my presentation. I'd like to call Ms. Nicole Christ forward to give a brief summary of the study that she has done on greenhouse gases at the facility. Ms. Christ. Thank you, Flynn. Um, members of council, we, um, at, at your request, we looked at the research papers we were provided as well as, as um, information from Mr. Friedman with the Sustainability Commission. Um, we redid this, the greenhouse gas analysis, by far the largest um, uh, GHG generator at a cannabis cultivation facility is energy production, um, which is not local production of GHGs, but is still GHG production. Um, the analysis um, f was done two different ways using um, two different models as outlined in our, in our memorandum that's attached to your staff report um, with the use of um, the renewables. The project remains um, less than significant in terms of GHG generation per the SCAQMD model, but in addition to that, um, will reduce its GHG emissions considerably by using renewable energy rather than traditional energy sources. And I'm glad to answer any questions. Thank you so much for the staff reports. Are there any questions of staff before we open the public hearing? Councilmember Horse. Yeah, I just want to make just so we're clear, so um, the agreement and the condition is that they use 100% carbon-free power, not renewable. Is that correct? Just because you use the term renewable, but we're talking about 100% carbon-free power? Yes, that is the way that we've worded the condition and the condition of approval. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Other questions for staff? Council Member Woods and then Council Member Garner. Um, has the applicant agreed to the additional conditions? As I had indicated, there is a September email from the applicant indicating that they are willing to use 100% carbon-free power. We also have the applicant available, as this is a public hearing, to speak to you this evening, and he can uh, offer his testimony on the record.
Thank you, Councilmember Garner. Um, can you just tell us the timeline of when the odor controls at the current project will be completed? Uh, in speaking with uh, Veronica from our uh, special programs compliance, uh, she had indicated that in their discussions, it appears that late January or early February, we should have the ANZA facility fully compliant. Other questions of staff before we open the public hearing? Seeing none, we will now open the public hearing. The applicant will have up to five minutes to provide their testimony, and the public is invited to speak on this public hearing for up to two minutes. City Clerk, if you could please begin. I believe the applicant's going to be joining via Zoom. <coughs> uh, he's trying to connect now. Thank you, welcome. You're live with the City Council and you have five minutes um, to provide your testimony in this public hearing. Thank you very much. Good evening, Mayor Holstead, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton, and Council members. Thank you for the opportunity of letting us be here tonight with you. My name is Gary LaSalle and I'm the Vice President of Operations for Kings Garden. Uh, per our last hearing, I'm here to provide you with an update on, on our project. Um, based on the conditions that uh, was presented to you. Yes, we have agreed to uh, commit to use 100% uh, carbon-free energy uh, through um, the city's DCE program. Um, the odor control uh, is being at our other facility to just kind of answer that. It is being worked on as of right now. We're actually anticipating a completion date no later than January 15th. Um, we have been in touch with Veronica um, of keeping her updated on the progress that we've been doing. Uh, it is scheduled through our harvests of each room and the last room, the last room being completed is on one three. Uh, once that's done, uh, the city's odor control consultant from 1500 Inc. will be out here to commission the system. They will also certify the system, which is something new for the city of Palm Springs through their ACOM Performance Verified Cannabis Cultivation um, Company. This will be the first within the city and is uh, going to be their gold standard for other facilities to, uh, to model. Our new project that uh, we're completing now will have the same type of systems in, included in that as well. Um, again, going through all of uh, the conditions that we've agreed upon, um, we feel that we have been able to uh, come to an agreement with the city and work together on this to where it meets both of our, our goals and getting this project moving forward. And uh, I, again, appreciate you uh, having us here tonight. I, I want to thank Veronica, Edward, and uh, Rick uh, in the city and all their staff in order to help uh, get us to this point. They've been extremely uh, instrumental up till now. And uh, I'm here for any questions that you have. Thank you so much. So we will now move to public comment. City Clerk, if you could contact public comment speakers. Madam Mayor, uh, we have no public comment. Uh, we had one person, but they withdrew. Thank you. So City Clerk, does the applicant get a rebuttal if you would like? Uh, if you would like. Um, applicant, you have two minutes for a rebuttal to no public comment if you would like to use it. I'm good at this time. Thank you. So there being no other speakers, um, that public hearing is now closed. Is there, are there any additional questions for the applicant from council members? Council member Garner. Can I make a, I know it's kind of question comment, is that okay? <laughs> Yeah, we don't have to separate it. We're allowed to deliberate now that the public hearing is over. I just thought for the interest of time, we could do that. But yes, feel free to make any comments or questions you'd like. Okay, thank you. Um, the reason I just wanted to bring up, I appreciate you having the timeline for the odor, um, um, sorry, the odor mitigation um, and that it's gonna be done um, fairly soon. I mean, it's only January is only a few months away. Um, but I did want to just raise that I'm, I'm still getting um, emails from surrounding businesses about concerns about odor. And I just wanted to raise that for you, Mr. LaSalle, because I, I know that 
they're they're very concerned and you know i'm making sure to let them know about the timeline and that things are going to be improving but um that's something that maybe you all want to consider is to talk to some of the the surrounding um business owners about um what's going on obviously that's not a condition <laughs> that we're going to impose on you but i just wanted to raise it because i got um i was contacted just earlier this week so i'm going to put that out there for you thank you Are there questions or comments from council member, council member Woods? If there's no other comments or question, I would move staff recommendation. It appears that staff and the applicant have worked tediously on making the recommendation that's before us. I'll second. Thank you. There's a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? I would just say to the applicant, thank you so much for caring about the impacts of your business on our desert environment, on our entire community, thinking through um, how to make this a cleaner and greener project. We very much appreciate you making those investments because we are all paying for it um, on the back end either way. So thank you very much for agreeing to do this work with us. Very welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. So there's a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Woods? Yes. Councilmember Kors? Yes. Councilmember Garner? Yes. Mayor Pro Tim Middleton? Aye. Mayor Holstich? Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here tonight with us. Have a good night. Thank you. You too. The next. And hotel. Add four additional guest rooms for a total of 168 guest rooms located at 414 North Palm Canyon Drive. If we can have a staff report, please. Madam Mayor and members of council, you may recall that uh, just a few months ago, we processed an amendment to the development plans for the Thompson Hotel, uh, increasing the guest room count from 150 rooms to 164 rooms, and also making some minor additions and changes to the southeast corner of the hotel. Uh, in doing some additional design work, the applicant has discovered that they uh, would like to uh, add four additional hotel rooms. Unfortunately, this does require them to go back through the process of obtaining planning commission review and city council approval for these additional guest rooms. Um, for some reason, my PowerPoint is not advancing. There, there we go. So in terms of the location of the guest rooms uh, that is being changed out, it's in the center of the site, as you can see here on the image on the screen. And so there won't be any changes that you'll notice on the exterior of the building. In addition, because the project has more parking spaces than are required by code, they have more than sufficient parking to accommodate the addition of the guest rooms. What is happening relative to this particular area is when we did the amendment back in June of this year, uh, the applicant had moved the fitness room to that location and also two meeting rooms. And what they're proposing to do is to just change that back into four guest rooms. With the fitness area and the spa, that will be relocated to the ground floor space of the hotel, uh, which had originally been intended as a retail space. The spa and the fitness center will now be available not only to hotel guests, but also to the general public. And so it will have an entrance from Palm Canyon. And we believe that having the spa and fitness facilities there uh, by making them available to the public will also energize the Palm Canyon frontage of the hotel and, and make it a successful facility. And so again, there are no impacts in terms of the exterior of the building. Uh, it is parked appropriately and staff and the Planning Commission both support this change. The Planning Commission did discuss this item last night at the Planning Commission meeting and voted five to zero to approve the item. With that, Madam Mayor, that concludes my staff report. I'm happy to answer any questions. And then the applicant is also available to answer any questions and is here for public comment. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Are there any questions for staff before we open the public hearing? Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Uh, and this, this is a question that's somewhat off uh, the issue of the uh, 
additional rooms. But do we have an estimate now as to uh, when uh, construction will uh, be resuming and when will construction be uh, complete in this uh, hotel opening? The applicant does have an active building permit for the site. And as they testified at Planning Commission last night, they are there on the site and are doing some work currently. The revised drawings for the southeast corner, the changes to the southeast corner of the hotel uh, are in the permitting stage. We are doing, I believe, the final check on those and should be able to issue the permit for that section of the hotel here within the next week or two. And so they are at the point and the applicant can go into further detail in terms of their construction schedule and their plans. But they do have an active building permit currently. Okay, very good. And I did see a truck coming out of there the other other day. It was uh, uh, it was really neat to see somebody actually there working. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Any other questions for city staff before we open the public hearing? Seeing none, I would like to open the public hearing. The applicant will have up to five minutes to provide their testimony, and then the public is invited to speak on this public hearing for up to two minutes. City Clerk, if you could please bring in the applicant. Hello, welcome. You're now live with the Palm Springs City Council and our public and staff um, who are here with us as well. If you could please introduce yourself and then um, you have five minutes to speak on this public hearing item. Well, thank you, Mayor Holstead and members of City Council for reviewing this. Um, staff did a great job introducing us. Uh, my name is Alex Kessmer. I'm with Hall Group. Um, also on the call, we have Brandon Dedman with SMS and then our president for Hall Group, uh, Don Braun, who will be speaking a little bit after me. Um, as shown on the documents that staff re relayed, um, with our recent changes in the last amendment, we had a discussion of moving some functions down to the spa. Um, and with that, we have started discussions with an operator that is going to that to the public as a public amenity on top of a hotel amenity, and then go back to the original design for building A, which increases the four rooms. Um, to achieve this, we didn't remove any key functions of the hotel. We moved some back of house space um, throughout level one and up to level two. And that created the room that we needed for the spa and fitness um, retail. So our ask as staff, um, relay to you is just to go back to the original design with the four rooms. And with that, I'll let um, Don Braun come in and talk about the update for our construction opening. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Uh, <clears throat> Mayor Holstead and uh, council members, uh, I don't have a, a, a long, long agenda here. I just really wanted to, uh, you know, come. I knew we were coming before you on the four room uh, addition request, but also just wanted to be available. Uh, to address questions, I know that uh, you know the question was uh, uh, was asked by uh, Council Member Woods about the start. You know, we have commenced uh, 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 the, the site to be reactivated. Uh, scaffolding is going up to start to repair the exterior uh, plaster. Uh, scaffolding and and other uh, interior interior means are are going forward with. To get everything ready to re uh, to sort of reignite uh, the site, so you know there's still you know I would say we have started construction, but sometimes again you see these things sort of build a little bit slowly just from a public viewpoint uh, because of uh, the amount of work involved just to make sure that everything uh, you know is is back up to to, to full repair. So. You know, our expectation is the hotel will be completed for the winter season of 22-23. So, you know, we would love to open this in December of next year. Uh, I don't want to come before you and, and say that, you know, we, that is for a certain, uh, we're certainly our internal goal and that's our, you know, our hope. Uh, but we do feel confident we'll be, we'll be open 
within the 22-23 winter season. <clears throat> Thank you. Would anyone like to add city clerk, how many minutes are we at? We have two minutes left. Thank you. Would you like to use the two minutes remaining for your applicant time? No, I know it's been a long council meeting. So, uh, you know, if there are no more questions, I can tell you we are diligently working on this and, uh, you know, uh, abiding by uh, uh, the things that we've talked to council before about. Thank you very much. City Clerk, are there any public speakers for this public hearing? Madam Mayor, we have no other public comments for this item. Thank you. So the applicant ha is invited to provide a rebuttal for up to two minutes if you would like to use it. I, again, we'll, we'll, we'll pass on that. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. The public hearing is now closed. Um, so this now would be an opportunity for city council to ask questions of the applicant, um, make a motion or provide further discussion. Oh. Council member Woods. Um, I think we're all relatively happy to see you working at the site um, and we're just pleased that something is moving forward and um, continues to progress without anything. But um, I see no problem with adding the rooms. The Planning Commission saw no problem with adding the rooms. I think those rooms were originally there and taken out, if I remember correctly, way back when. Um, so I would move the item, the staff recommendation. Thank you. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. second. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, if we can have roll call vote, please. Council Member Woods. Yes. Council Member Kors. Yes. Council Member Garner. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Aye. Mayor Holstage. Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here this evening and for your work, um, your investment in this project and for getting it under construction. We appreciate it. We're looking forward to the opening 2022, right. 2023. Thank, thank you for your support. And look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Yeah. The next item is item 2C, consideration of an appeal requesting that the city council overturn the decision of the planning commission to approve a major architectural application to construct a new 5,846 square foot residence and a 576 square foot detached casita with rooftop deck on a hillside lot located at 585 Camino Calidad. If we can have a staff report, please. Madam Mayor and members of council, this I is- have to, I have to go first. Oh. Thank you, sorry about that. <laughs> council member Garner has to recuse on this item. So we will put her in a Zoom room and yeah. then we will do the staff report. For, for financial reasons, I'm, I still have to recuse. Thank you. Thank you. So Madam Mayor and members of council, continuing with the staff report, this item is an appeal of the approval of a single family home in a hillside area. The Planning Commission reviewed the application and approved it on September the 1st. The appellant then filed an appeal shortly thereafter. In terms of the proposal, the house, as has been indicated, is approximately 5,800 square feet, and then it also has a detached 576 square foot casita on the site. Uh, in a hillside area, it does have a garage that is excavated below the principal uh, floor of the residence. And uh, you can see the elevations here on the left and then the site plan and floor plan on the right here on the screen. In terms of the appeal that was filed, I'm going to summarize it by identifying three primary issues. The appellant uh, and his attorney are here this evening and will be able to go into additional detail. Uh, but summarizing the issues, number one is relative to the underground garage and also related to that, the building pad height. Secondly, there is a concern about the rooftop deck. And then third, there is a concern about the scale and the size of the residence. Let me just go through those issues individually. In terms of an underground garage, it is permitted in the city of Palm Springs to have basements, including basement garages, provided that at least 50% is below grade. 
Uh, also, the applicant is requesting that they have a garage and a music room that would be located below the main floor of the dwelling. The applicant is also requesting uh, a pad height on the site of a 529 feet above uh, uh, sea level. Um, this is relevant as I'll go into the next uh, drawing showing you uh, how that relates to the adjacent houses. Uh, ultimately, the Planning Commission requested that the applicant lower the pad height in order to address some of the concerns that were cited in the Planning Commission meeting relative to the overall impact of the home. In terms of underground garages, we do have quite a number of them around the city, primarily in our hillside areas, just as it makes sense there in terms of the differences in the grade and accommodating a garage on the site, uh, although there is at least one instance of an underground garage in a non-hillside area as you look at the lower left. In terms of the underground garage, this is a section through the residence. The street is on the left-hand side. Uh, the garage is under the living area there. It's more or less relatively level with the top of curb. As recommended by the Planning Commission, however, this would be decreased two feet uh, lower, and so that would reduce the overall impact of the residence relative to the adjacent neighbor. In terms of the pad height, we did have the applicant's architect go through several iterations showing what the uh, pad height would do relative to the adjacent houses. Um, the original proposal by the architect is at the top of this drawing showing a pad height of 529 feet. The middle is the, uh, the uh, recommendation of the Planning Commission uh, which is kind of in between two different variety, uh, two different options that we looked at. Uh, and so the middle one is at 527 feet and then uh, was also recommended by engineering that we look at 525 feet. Uh, but the, the middle is the one that was recommended by the Planning Commission and uh, it probably mediates best the elimination or the removal of soil from the site in terms of excavation and the impacts that that would cause on the neighborhood relative to the scale of the residence and the property that is to the north that is somewhat lower in terms of its pad height. Next, going into the issue of the rooftop deck, the zoning code does permit rooftop decks. However, it's subject to a number of conditions. Uh, number one, that they cannot uh, have a roof. Number two, they must conform to the height envelope, and that includes any railings or any stairs. And number three, they cannot be habitable or they cannot be conditioned space or enclosed. The rooftop deck, as proposed, does conform to code requirements. Uh, the question is raised in the appellant's letter is whether or not roof decks are permitted. Again, they are permitted by code. Uh, we have a rather famous example in the Kaufman House built in 1947, uh, which does have a rooftop deck. We have more recent examples, the Tuscany Heights development up at the top of Racket Club Road. Nearly half of the residences in that development have rooftop decks. Uh, we also have examples elsewhere in the city, uh, such as this one at the lower left in Movie Colony East. Uh, the best rooftop decks are ones that you don't even know are there, and so that's certainly something we encourage in terms of our regulations. Relative to the applicant's proposal, the rooftop deck is located on the casita on the south end of the site. The casita itself is slightly depressed relative to the principal residence, and so that helps to lower the height of the rooftop deck. Based on the comments at Planning Commission, the architect has proposed to locate translucent glass on the south and west sides of the rooftop deck in order to eliminate any sight lines to adjacent properties. As you look here in this illustration, there is a yellow line with an arrow showing the rooftop deck in relationship to its views and the neighbor to the right, uh, the appellant. Uh, 
uh, based on the sight line provided by this arrow and the position of the principal residence, uh, anyone who is occupying the rooftop deck should not be able to see into the appellant's yard. The architect has also proposed to extend that translucent glass uh, to a portion of the north side right around the staircase uh, so that any views that may be possible to the appellant's yard would be further curtailed. Moving on to the scale and the size of the residence, in the appellant's letter it does note that there are a few residences in the neighborhood that are larger than this one, uh, but the majority of the residences in the neighborhood are smaller. Uh, in terms of staff, we did take a look around the neighborhood in terms of the square footage of adjacent residences. We do concur with the opinion of the appellant that it is one of the larger residences in the neighborhood. However, it does conform to our lot coverage requirements and our setback requirements. In fact, looking at the lot coverage requirements, there is a maximum of 35% lot coverage. This residence, as designed, covers 23% of the lot, so it's well within the maximum lot coverage requirements. So while it is larger than many of the residences in the neighborhood, it does conform to our code requirements, uh, and staff and the Planning Commission felt that it was appropriate in terms of its size and scale. Ultimately, our recommendations are as follows relative to this appeal. Number one, regarding the pad height, staff feels that maintaining the pad height at 527 feet helps to mitigate some of the concerns of the appellant while not going to the extreme of requiring a lot of excavation to lower the residence. Secondly, the appellant, uh, in terms of talking about the underground garage and a concern about the number of spaces in the garage, uh, cited that they have concerns that this residence may have a need for additional parking spaces. One of the things I've discussed with the project architect is the possibility of adding an additional surface parking space. I would like the architect to speak to that if they are able to accommodate that. And then the third point, as suggested by the project architect, is to add partial glass screening on the north side of the rooftop deck in order to address the appellant's concerns about sight lines uh, and noise relative to the rooftop deck. That concludes my presentation to you. I'm happy to answer any questions about this proposed dwelling and uh, the action of the Planning Commission. As I've indicated, the appellant is available and will be on Zoom, as well as the architect uh, for the property owner, and they will also participate in public comment this evening. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you so much for the staff report. Are there questions of staff before we open the public hearing? Seeing none, I would like to open the public hearing. The applicant and then the appellant will each have up to five minutes to provide their testimony. And then the public is invited to speak on this public hearing for up to two minutes. City Clerk, if you could please invite the applicant to um, provide their testimony. Good evening, welcome. You're live with the city council and the public. If you could please introduce yourself and then you have up to five minutes to provide your testimony in this public hearing. Please begin. Um, Bruce, uh, could you clarify, do you represent the applicant or appellant? Or the appellant. Okay. If you could give us uh, one, one minute, we're, we're trying to bring in the applicant. Okay. Madam Mayor, that is the applicant. It's uh, architect. 
Thank you. Welcome. If you could please introduce yourself and you have up to five minutes to provide your testimony in this public hearing. Please begin. Yeah, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor, Council and staff. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to, to speak this evening. My name is Lance O'Donnell. As a local architect, I've had the great fortune to work with clients like Chad and Tenna Dyer. The Dyers contacted me late last year and were excited uh, and proud owners of a new vacant lot at 585 Camino Caladad. Having completed nearly two... Yes. Sorry, go ahead, continue. Lance, is there a problem? Hello, Lance, can you hear us? Hello, Lance. Lance, you're muted. Can you hear us? Yes. I can hear you. There, there's a delay in uh, my presentation. Okay, so you can um, try to sign on and sign off again. You could try to take off your camera, though you have a right to be here and be seen. Sometimes that helps at the beginning. Um, city clerk, if you have other recommendations for the applicant. I agree. It's to turn off your camera. Usually that improves your internet quality and you can provide your comments. Yes, I can. I can hear everybody speaking. And we can hear you and I didn't hear any delay for your um, presentation. So um, if you can, so we will give you, we'll restart over and you have five minutes. Please begin. Lance, are you there? We we are waiting, and and yes, I am here. Can you please present your presentation? Okay. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council, and staff. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Lance O'Donnell. As a local architect. I've had the great pleasure to work with many clients like Chad and Tenna Dyer. The Dyers contacted me late last year and were proud owners of a new vacant lot. City Clerk, do we need to take a break while we work yeah. with the applicant to resolve his technical issues? Let's take a five minute break. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, Mr. O'Donnell, you have five minutes. Please um, begin. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Council, and staff. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Lance O'Donnell. As a local architect, I have the great fortune to work with many clients like Chad and Tana Dyer. The Dyers contacted me late last year and were the proud owners of 585 Camino Caledad. Having completed nearly two dozen hillside homes in the city of Palm Springs since opening my Palm Springs-based architectural practice in 1994, uh, I take great uh, pride um, to have thoughtful clients like the Dyers. And the Dyers and the process becomes one of a team effort through the design, approval, and construction process. We understand the need uh, for and value community involvement. In all the years that I've been practicing in Palm Springs, I've known five planning directors, countless engineering, planning, building, and safety staff. However, one guiding document has remained largely unchanged, the city's zoning code, and with it, the hillside ordinance. The, reading, the reason this guiding document has stood the test of time, in my opinion, is its consistency, fairness, and its balanced approach to planning. Also key to the Hillside Ordinance and success is the city's longstanding public review process. This includes dedicated design professionals on the Architectural Advisory Committee, now Architectural Review Board, and the city's uh, planning commission. Uh, the Architectural Advisory Committee reviewed the Camino Caledad project and voted unanimously to approve. Further to the AAC's approval was the Planning Commission's two reviews of the project. First, to request additional exhibits, and second, giving the project unanimous approval. Having personally spent 10 years on the Architectural Advisory Committee, I know that it takes dedication and commitment and all AAC members and planning commission members give their time and talent solely for the better. It takes dedication of our community. And all AAC uh, and planning commission members give their time and talent. Can you please mute yourself when you're not speaking? You're interrupting the applicant. Thank you. Applicant, if you could please begin, continue. So, Mr. Howard Hyman, um, please mute your line. Thank you. Applicant, I'm so sorry, Mr. O'Donnell, if you could please continue. Uh, I'll back up just slightly. Um, uh, the Planning Commission first uh, requested at the first meeting additional exhibits, and after uh, requesting additional exhibits at the second meeting, voted unanimously to approve the project. Having personally spent over 10 years on the Architectural Advisory Committee, I know the, dedicate, the dedication it takes for the Architectural Advisory Committee members and Planning Commission, um, and they give their time and talent solely for the betterment of our community. Given the city's established and rigorous review process, I respectfully request that the Commission uphold the Planning Department's recommendation to deny Mr. Hyman's appeal. On a couple of things that uh, uh, Planning Director um, mentioned uh, there was one error. The, the total square footage for the home, home plus casita, is 5,846 square feet. And of the three items that he said we would take under consideration to investigate additional parking, we have we our garage is set back over 30 feet, and with a typical city parking stall, we can fit four cars in our driveway. Um, with plenty of room. So we know that the driveway fits uh, four cars. The garage has two cars. We can get six cars on the property. And we hope that that allays Mr. Hyman's concerns for parking. Um, as to the additional privacy screen at the um, rooftop deck, we would, uh, yeah, we would gladly install that additional portion to forestall any views um, to and from Mr. Hyman's property to the rooftop deck. So we would gladly do that. Um, I don't really recall what the third item was, but uh, none of them seemed onerous and, and we would undertake any of those if requested. 
and I thank you for your time. Thank you so much for Mr. Thank you so much, Mr. O'Donnell. And we apologize for the technical difficulties and also the interruption there. Um, thank you very much. So next, the appellant has up to five minutes to provide their testimony. If you could please introduce yourself and begin. And I think this is Mr. Yes. Bauer. Welcome. Yes, that, that is correct. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Holstage, Mayor Pro Tem Middleton, City Council members, city manager, and city staff. I want to uh, especially thank the city staff who's been very welcoming and very uh, agreeable to meeting with us uh, regarding our various concerns. My name is Bruce Bauer and I'm the attorney for Howard Hyman. He's the appellant here. He resides along with his family at 525 Camino Calidad, which is just north of the proposed project. Mr. Hyman appeals from the September 1 Planning Commission decision to approve this 5,846 square foot single family residence along with a 576 square foot casita and a 250 foot rooftop deck, a total then of 6,672 square feet at 585 Camino Caladad. This is an appeal of an approved home project the City Council is urged to carefully consider this project. While there are instances where differing uh, items of this project have been accepted and approved in the city elsewhere, such as rooftop decks and subterranean base or parking, there is no project that I'm aware of in the city that is approved and allowed for all of these elements to be taken together. So here you have a maximum floor height variance request, subterranean parking, which includes a music room, a 250 foot rooftop, and a home of five bedrooms of the casita with only two parking stalls in the garage area. I wanted to point out a couple of things about Mr. Hyman. Mr. Hyman has been a proud and contributing resident of the city of Palm Springs for around 40 years now. He's not anti-development. In fact, he's not opposed to the proposed construction of a dwelling that lies right behind him at 502 La Mirada. The square footage in that house is 4,391 square feet. If you compose that, compare that against the proposed total square footage of everything that they're requesting in connection with the current project of 6,672 feet, you can see the scale of the problem here. This project is about 50% larger than the one proposed on La Mirada. So what you have here is an extraordinarily dense project. And while it does meet the requirements technically of the city, the city should be very concerned about this sort of development in total. The size and scope of the, pro the project is very concerning. And if I could ask the planning director to show the elevations, again, that he showed the three different elevations, you can see the request is that the project uh, be scaled at 527.50 feet. We're requesting that it be scaled at 525.50 uh, feet, lowered by two feet. And the concern that the planning director and the city staff has indicated is that they've opted for the higher elevation because it would be extreme to the applicant. Now, what does extreme to the applicant mean? In this instance, it means it's more expensive for the applicant to build that sort of construction. But what it means to my client and adjoining homeowners is that they will have two more feet of view rights. So extreme is a relative term here. It seems to us very reasonable to ask that this applicant incur the additional expense and requirements needed to reduce the height of this and the scope and scale of this project. The applicant has also requested that rooftop deck, and we are glad to hear for the first time that he's agreed to put a translucent glass on the north side of the, uh, that deck, which we would agree is necessary. Uh, and for no other reason, we need that for sound attenuation. So if uh, we can have the similar side, sized uh, glass, translucent glass on the north side, we are agreeable to that. The project is 
uh, as proposed should not be approved since it grants applicants all of their wish items and the adjoining homeowners, especially our client, are stuck with an inordinate burden for both of its construction scale and ongoing burden. Taken together, these requests are unprecedented in the city. And while the applicant can cite rare, example, rare examples as in instances where some or more of these features are allowed in the city, there are no residents in the city that allow, or that we're aware of that allowed all of these features taken together. Mr. And Bauer? Yes. That's, that's your time. Thank you, Mr. Bauer. So next, um, the next city clerk, we move to public speakers. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Are there any speakers? Uh, yes, we do. We have one. Thank you. Madam Mayor, uh, the public comment or the public speaker didn't want to continue. However, I do have a, a written comment as an accommodation given the late hour. I'm going to go ahead and read it. Um, this is from, I'm sorry, Sydney Williams. I would like to speak in support of the Lance O'Donnell Dyer residence located at 525 Camino Calidad. We are fortunate in Palm Springs to have outstanding architects who are designing exceptional commercial and residential projects and Lance is one of this select group. He is well aware of our architectural legacy of excellence and strives to further that tradition. As a fourth generation resident of the Coachella Valley, Lance understands the climate and the environment and designs with this knowledge in mind. I'm familiar with his many projects over more than 20 year period, and I'm always impressed by the creative, or I'm sorry, by the variety of creative solutions he achieves. A recipient of several AIA awards, Lance Design for the Dyer Residence, will surely receive that level of recognition. Moreover, as an architect design project, it will enhance the neighborhood and will likely increase the value of the surrounding homes. Both the Planning Commission and the AAC approved this project unanimously, and their expert judgment should be upheld. Since Lance is an experienced in building in Palm Springs, is familiar with zoning laws, building codes, and the requirements of building on a hillside lot. I applaud his design and urge you to reject the app appellant's appeal. Thank you for your consideration. And Madam Mayor, that concludes public comment. Thank you, and we apologize to the public for the late hour um, and appreciate City Clerk you making that accommodation, which we're always happy to make um, to read those comments out loud if it is too late for folks. Um, so next, the appellant will have two minutes for rebuttal if you so choose, and then the applicant will have two minutes for final rebuttal if they choose. Is that correct, City Clerk? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Appellant, uh, if you well, could please begin. Yes, I mean, we do, we do not take any exception with respect to the architect's work. He's a talented architect. There's no question. We aren't impugning the architect, as the, the prior speaker suggested. Rather, the, the applicant itself is seeking, as is what you would expect often from an applicant, they want to emphasize the value of their property by building it as densely as possible. Now, that only helps the applicant. Now, in terms of the my client, the appellant who sits to the North of them, they're going to be shut out. They've requested a variance of two feet in connection with the build out of this project. They're going to be shut out for the rest of the time they purchase this property and anyone who purchases it from that view. So I, I urge you to reconsider the project, the skies and scope and everything taken together, the request that we're making that they reduce the height of the house by two feet is a reasonable one. And, the, and while the Planning Commission did vote unanimously, there was definitely contention, content, the, the height issue was definitely a contentious issue. Thank you so much, Mr. Bauer. Um, does that complete your comments? It does. Thank you. So now, Mr. O'Donnell, as the applicant, you have two minutes for rebuttal if you so choose. 
Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I'd just like to correct some inaccuracies. Again, the total square footage of the Dyer residence is 5,846 square feet. Uh, the way the definition of uh, square footage is calculated, it does not calculate decks, patios, um, rooftop decks in that calculation. The total open space for this project is 23, or the total built area is 23%. Uh, it's exactly the same uh, open space as Mr. Hyman's residence at 23%. Uh, it's specious to say that the density, bulk, and other things for this project are exceeding the neighborhood. We're at 23% open space on this. Uh, Mr. Howard Hyman on the record said that he has no views to the south. His views are to the west and north. It's in his public testimony. So I'm... I'm yeah, I'm flummoxed at, uh, at the continued uh, insertion that this home is larger than any other home in the neighborhood. And additionally, no variances were sought for height. Um, there's a typical process, which is the administrative minor modification that was used for a height at a minimum setback. But that same process was used on Mr. Hyman's house and the house to the south of the Dyers. So it's a process that's used every day and no variances were sought. And the height of the home is in perfect keeping with uh, accepted city standards. So yeah, again, um, you know, we were seeking approval of the very uh, diligent process that the city goes through and um, I'll leave it at that, thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Donnell. Does that complete your comments? It does, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for participating and for all of the comment that we've received. Um, City Clerk, are there any additional speakers? No other speakers. Thank you, the public hearing is now closed. Um, so moving to City Council, is there any discussion or additional questions for the council, from the council? Council Member Kors. Great, thank you. Uh, one question for the city attorney, uh, just so I'm clear, because the issue of the square footage of the casita or accessory dwelling unit came up. My understanding, based on current law, is even if that wasn't built now, it's just sort of an over-the-counter to get those under state law and city law now after the fact, right? Uh, yes, <clears throat> Councilmember Coors, uh, under current California law, accessory dwelling units, um, as long as they meet the requirements of the local ordinance, um, would be approved ministerially. And so this, um, while it's called a casita, um, presumably would meet the requirements of that ADU ordinance and would be uh, able to be approved ministerially, even if um, just the uh, primary house were, were built initially. Great, thanks. And I just want to disclose, since it's a public hearing, that Councilmember Woods and I, at the request of Mr. O'Donnell, did have a virtual uh, presentation from him um, about the house and what happened uh, with the Planning Commission. Uh, we did not provide any comments or ask any questions. We just listened, but I did want to share that with the public. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Kors. Any other questions from council members or discussion or direction? Madam Mayor, I, I did get um, a notice from uh, Mr. Rahim, who, who did register uh, earlier. Uh, I think we recorded his phone number wrong. Would you be open to uh, opening the public hearing again and taking this comment? Yes, please. Thank, Thank you. you. So if we reopen the public hearing and take this additional comment, does the applicant and the appellant have an additional rebuttal? I would recommend maybe two minutes each, yes. Thank you. Um, so in the interest of a full public process, we will reopen the public hearing and we will invite um, the public speak comment speaker to begin. John Rahim, you're live at the Palm Springs City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. 
Um, good, evening, good evening, City Council members and Mayor Holstead. Uh, my name is John Ram. I, um, I was the former planning director of the city of San Francisco for 12 years until my retirement last year, and I'm now a resident of Palm Springs, which I truly love. I think Palm Springs is one of the few cities that was built largely in the 20th century that has a strong sense of place, and I think that has very much to do with the architectural legacy of the city. And in my opinion, this project continues to uh, continues that legacy. I just thought, would like to make three brief points. One is that the project appears to me to meet all code requirements. I don't need to go into details. You've heard that. But I have reviewed the, the drawings and the documents submitted by both the applicant and the appellant, and I uh, believe all code requirements are actually met. Second, the design is very consistent with the aesthetic in that neighborhood and with the overall design aesthetic of Palm Springs. I'm familiar with Lance's work, and I think he really understands the design context. I would also say, frankly, that lowering the garage is actually a design benefit of the project, which should be embraced by the neighborhood rather than having the garage be front and center, as it is in many projects. Um, thirdly, um, I think most importantly, I urge you not to set a precedent to sort of support an appeal of this type of project. In my 30 years of work as a city planner, I found that it's quite common and understandable for neighbors to want less bulk in size than the code might allow and for builders and developers to want more. For me, it is important to say no to both. The code has to mean something. I understand that there is often room for interpretation and codes are complicated, but the basics are important to uphold so that everyone is playing by the same set of rules. If each project becomes a separate negotiation, there is no basis for agreement and can be, frankly, become very chaotic. And frankly, that was my experience in San Francisco, where, where a lot of individual negotiation has led to far too many cases where the loudest or most powerful voices win. I strongly urge you not to go in that direction. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak. I admire your perseverance on this very long meeting. I know you have difficult decisions on these matters, and I just want to thank you for your service and willingness to do what's best for the city. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Mayor, thank you for taking that public comment, and uh, that does conclude. Thank you. So we will go to the appellant who has up to two minutes to provide a rebuttal again, and the applicant who has up to two minutes to provide a rebuttal again. Mr. Bauer. Sorry about that. Yeah, so while the uh, speaker made the point that this was in keeping with the development of that particular area in that neighborhood, well, none of the instances that we've been provided of subterranean parking or rooftop decks are in that neighborhood. So that point cannot be true. There, neither of those instances are allowed in that or we've seen in that neighborhood. Most of those instances that you see are developed property that have been developed many years ago. So that point just is not valid. And it's certainly within the right of the appellant to seek and be concerned about development next to him without being deemed NIMBY or uh, that being objectionable. There's development, as I indicated, behind Mr. Hyman, and he hasn't objected to that development at all. This development is a horse of a different color, and that's why the city should be concerned, because it's, it's in total, it's bringing different elements together that are, is not present in any project that we are aware of or anyone cited to us that has and absorbs all of those elements. And certainly within the height, there is discretion with the city to determine what the height should be allowed and permitted in the, in the setting as, as this. And so it's not an unreasonable request, given everything that we've asked, that that be reduced by two feet. Now, there is additional cost associated with the applicant. And we understand that the builders don't want to and the applicants don't want to absorb those costs. But those costs are temporary. The loss of a view and the the scale and scope of a, bit, a house next to you is permanent and everlasting. With that, I have nothing further. Thank you. Mr. O'Donnell, would you like to use two minutes of rebuttal time? Yes, I would, uh, Madam Mayor, thank you. Um, again, the project open space is 23% of the entire site. Uh, we can accommodate the parking that um, on site, we are not requesting any variances. Uh, our, uh, my client's property is uh, approximately five feet above 
the adjacent property and uh, approximately three feet below the property above that uh, to the south. So the, the property is in keeping with the, the street side uh, progression of heights along the street. And then further, the overall height of my client's home is even given the additional five feet of elevation and pad height is, is only 18 inches above the neighbor to the south. Um, so I, I, the, the bulk and mass of uh, the Dyer residence is entirely in keeping with the streetscape. Uh, the tuck under parking that we're utilizing um, is a very valid approach to reducing bulk and creating uh, a streetscape that is pleasant. Um, there are many, there were, we counted 10 projects in a quarter mile radius with the same tuck under parking we're utilizing. So again, um, we feel this is a, a perfectly suitable project for the community, one that will be hopefully celebrated in the future. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to uh, your approval tonight, so thank you. Thank you, does that conclude your comments? It does. Thank you, so we will now close the public comment, thank, public hearing, thank you for everyone bearing with us there as we did that twice to allow for public comment. Um, so city council discussion or questions? Council Member Woods. I'd like to ask a question of staff if I can. Is staff still available? Um, the question that I have from staff is I heard the appellant say that there was a variance. I read the entire staff report and don't think or don't recall that there was a variance on this project. Is that true or false? There is no variance for the project. As the architect has indicated in the city's hillside ordinance, we do allow for a process called an administrative minor modification relative to height. The hillside ordinance does allow a height of up to 30 feet above adjacent grade upon the planning commission's approval of an administrative minor modification. Uh, and so there is no variance. Uh, however, in the hillside ordinance, it does allow for an administrative minor modification. Thank you. You know, the beauty of this neighborhood, this is a beautiful neighborhood, by the way. Um, so congratulations for one, owning a home there, Mr. Bauer, and for building a home there, potentially here, Mr. O'Donnell. So it's a beautiful neighborhood. And the beauty of it is that it's a neighborhood that has an eclectic mix of custom homes. Uh, and that really makes this neighborhood unique to go to. And I have to agree with the speaker that spoke is that we don't want to start negotiating each one unless there's some really bad detrimental effects on the adjacent neighbors. And there was no compelling evidence supplied by the appellant to make that determination. So I'm in line with the planning commission and the architecture review committee and would move staff recommendation. Thank you. There's a motion to approve staff recommendation. Is there a second? I'll second. And I have a question for staff. Thank Great, you. so there's a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Council member Kors? Sure, just for staff, um, given this appeal and it going to planning, were the neighbors within 500 feet all notified of this? Yes, that is correct. Okay, and none of them have come forward to speak against this? Uh, other those than those who have offered uh, public comment letters or testimony this evening. Okay, thank you. I just want to confirm that. Thank you, Mayor. A motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. You're on mute. Excuse me. Clarify. Uh, have has any other neighbor uh, spoken up either in support or opposition uh, to this project? I believe the neighbor to the south uh, spoke relative to the project, had concerns relative to the roof dot deck, uh, and the translucent panels were added to uh, appease that neighbor. Uh, that's the only one that I am aware of. I don't know if the appellant or the architect are aware of any other neighbors who have spoken. All 
All right, I, I hear no one speaking up, so uh, we take every uh, everyone's uh, view uh, seriously, but uh, it, it is somewhat telling that uh, uh, there is not uh, more than one. Thank you. So there's a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, we can if we can have a roll call vote, please. And just to be clear, um, the motion was to uh, move staff recommendation. Councilmember Woods. Yes. Councilmember Kors. Yes. Councilmember Garner. Is She's recused. Here. Mayor Pro Tim Middleton. Aye. Mayor Holstedge. Yes. Motion passes four to zero. Thank you all. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your work and being part of our community. We very much appreciate you doing this work with us at 1030 p.m. Have a great Thank evening. You. Thank you. Thank you. So the next item, so we sh can check in. So we've completed all of the public hearing items. Um, we took item 3A and moved it to the next council meeting. Um, and we have unfinished business. So item 4A, review of emergency orders related to COVID. Um, we have also moved, we have also 5A um, for exotic extractions. We heard public comment on that. So I'd like to do that one tonight. Um, and then we moved item 5B to the next council meeting as well. Um, so for city council, would you like to move to item um, 5 Four. 5A exotic extractions request for administrative minor modification since we heard public comment on that item um, and they're probably participating in five hours into listening to this meeting um, for that item I would propose that council um, move forward on that item and then see where we are for the rest of the agenda. So I have consensus around that. Okay, so the next item is item 5A, a um, request from Exotic Extractions LLC um, for an administrative minor modification for relief from the minimum separation distance requirement for a cannabis dispensary for the purpose of non-storefront delivery service at 1251 Montalvo Way, Unit L, Zone M1P, Case 7.1641 AMM. Can we have a staff report, please? Madam Mayor and members of council, this is a request for a separation distance waiver for a proposed dispensary. The uh, dispensary is located within 90 linear feet of another dispensary. They are both in the same industrial building. Our code does require a minimum 500 foot separation distance between dispensaries. It should also be noted that the applicant is uh, requesting this dispensary license so that they can do a delivery service. They're not really intending uh, to do a walk-in dispensary for customers, but more for the delivery service itself. A dispensary license is required for delivery service. It should also be noted that the applicant is already licensed for transportation and distribution of cannabis products. In terms of the physical location of the dispensary and its delivery service, uh, it would be located in Unit L of the building at 1251 Montalvo Way. Uh, this is a site plan showing the building. As you can see, there is another dispensary, the Higher Vision Dispensary, that is located in Units F and G of the same building, and they are approximately 90 feet apart. In terms of the space itself, the dispensary where the product will be stored for delivery is located at the front and will occupy approximately 250 square feet within the tenant space. In terms of the findings for the distance waiver, uh, first of all is relative to the use in the general plan. The use is allowed by the zoning. Uh, however, with the concentration of cannabis facilities within that building, it may conflict with the general plan goal for a balance of uses. As there are neighboring businesses that are also involved in cannabis operations, uh, they will not be impacted by this dispensary. Uh, however, please note that there will be two dispensary licenses within 500 feet. 
the proposed dispensary will have to adhere to all requirements in Chapter 5.55 of the Municipal Code, uh, and so it will comply and protect public health, safety, and welfare. There are no unique site features which would warrant, however, the uh, separation distance waiver. The City Council has adopted optional findings under resolution number 24799. Uh, these are those findings in staff's assessment. Uh, the property is not blighted. That is one of the optional findings. Uh, in terms of the tenant space and the vacant status of the tenant space, it was last occupied in 2018, uh, so within the last three years. In terms of uh, concentration of dispensaries, as noted, uh, there is an existing dispensary in the building. In terms of the hours and operations, it will have hours uh, that will be compatible with adjacent businesses. And then the final optional criterion is relative to participation in the so social equity program, and the applicant is not a participant in that program. Uh, so that concludes staff's assessment of the findings. We've presented you with two options this evening. Uh, you could make the finding that the dispensary being that relative to a delivery service uh, will not impact adjacent businesses and will uh, be consistent with the findings that are necessary for a waiver. Or you could also find that based on the fact that there is an over-concentration of cannabis businesses within the same industrial business, that there will be impacts from that concentration of use, and you could deny this request. That concludes staff's report to you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions or comments from council members? I see council member Coors and then council member Woods. Yeah, I just have a, qu a question. So I appreciate for delivery, they need a dispensary license, but could this be conditioned that they, they could not do any other dispensary um, activities other than delivery from there? Uh, I believe that, yes, you could place conditions upon this waiver and upon the license that would restrict uh, the dispensary to delivery only. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. That's just my question. Council Member Woods. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I personally, for this particular area, do not have a problem with the, the close proximity, but I am concerned and I do have a question about the impact to the adjacent residential that's a little further away uh, and to the Asina neighborhood, which complained quite heavily about this, this particular area way back when, about odor. And I don't know how they're delivering it, how they're going with a quantity of, of product from, especially if it's flour, from the facility to the transport vehicle and how that odor is mitigated. So in terms of dispensaries, the vast majority of the product is in sealed packages, which helps to eliminate the odor concerns. Uh, as we've heard from testimony from the city's odor control consultant, the primarily, primary impact from odor is relative to cultivation and certain types of manufacturing. The applicant is not engaged in those activities, nor do they have a license for those activities. Uh, we've seen that distribution and uh, dispensaries typically have limited uh, impacts relative to odors, and so there should not be impacts to adjacent residences in either the neighborhood to the north or to the Asina neighborhood to the east. So thank you. With that in mind, um, um, and with um, Council Member Core's condition that they cannot be a storefront, um, I would move the staff recommend. I would move to approve the distance, the, the waiver of the distance. Thank you. So there's a motion um, to approve the administrative minor modification for relief from the minimum separation distance requirement. Uh, is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, um, can we have a roll call vote, please? 
Councilmember Woods. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Aye. Councilmember Garner. Yes. Councilmember Kors. Yes. Mayor Holstich. Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. So would you like to do item four A review of emergency orders related to COVID-19? Yes. Yes. Great. So we will call that item four A review of emergency orders related to COVID-19. If we can have a staff report, please. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council. Uh, so I have a, a little bit more robust brief than I normally do and a, at a bit later of an hour than, than normal for me. Uh, so this update is going to include our normal COVID update as well as uh, a look at some of the different requirements uh, at the federal level, the state level, uh, where we are here in Palm Springs, as well as a, a look at a couple other cities. Uh, and then the last thing we're going to touch on is the Chamber of Commerce's uh, COVID survey that ended, I believe, on Monday. So the first slide, just an update on the COVID vaccination status here in Palm Springs. Uh, overall, we're about 80% vaccinated. That is uh, all people 12 years of age and older. Uh, this data was as of the 19th, so a few more people have probably gotten their uh, second injection but overall about 80%, which is pretty good for the area. Next slide you guys are all familiar with. It's the, the state six metrics that they look at uh, for COVID, including positive cases, deaths, testing, hospitalization, and uh, ICU rates. Uh, the, big, the big thing from this is we're still on that downward trend, that, that backside of this second wave. Uh, this slide, just Riverside County snapshot from going all the way back to March when COVID uh, first hit us. We can see Riverside County has over 362,000 positive cases. The red circles are just a highlight, that peak that we had around Christmas, and then the low that we had right before summertime, and then where we are for the past uh, two months. As we look at that, uh, the counties ha had an average of 26,000 weekly cases around Christmas time. The actual peak rate was 34,000 cases just the week of January 12th. Uh, as we came out of that wave, numbers got down pretty significantly and they hit a low of 328 average cases weekly for the months of May and June, uh, with the actual low point hitting 152 cases in one week in Riverside County. Uh, and where we've been for the past eight weeks, the average is a little over 3,400. Uh, what that doesn't show you is for the past three weeks, we've been around 2,500. So while we've had a lot of improvement, we are not where we were pre-summer, but we are still making improvement. This is the, the same slides uh, just for Palm Springs. As you can see, Palm Springs, we've had uh, just under 4,700 positive cases, and we'll look at those averages uh, so at the same time periods, uh, around Christmas time, we had 286 average weekly cases here in the city, uh, with the actual peak being a 438 cases the week of January 12th. And then we went down very, very significantly to seven cases per week, so one case per day. Uh, and the week of June 15th, we actually got down to four cases for the week. Uh, and then for the past two months, we've been hovering at 33 cases per week, uh, last three weeks has been around 22. Another slide that you're all familiar with, the uh, Coachella Valley, shows the same basic trend. Uh, for the past four weeks, we've seen this general downward trend from where we were at the height of summer. Um, what that also shows is that we're still gonna have the occasional outlier case, so like Indio had a, a pretty significant uptick last week, but again, that's an outlier week. Next few slides are going to cover the wastewater treatment testing numbers. First slide shows the data going back to when we first started testing. And this data just mirrors the other metrics that we've seen where we had the peak around Christmas and then uh, it came down significantly up until the first few months of summer. And then we hit this second wave that we've been on the backside for about five or six weeks now. 
as we take a closer look at the past 90 days of that, that wastewater treatment testing, uh, we can see that we've been on a very slow, gradual downward trend. We do have two peaks, uh, one uh, at around Labor Day and the other one on Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, we test uh, the effluent on Mondays and Tuesdays, so it's always going to be after a busy weekend. And those are both Tuesdays, which was after a holiday. But the, the GT molecular uh, estimates, the numbers do keep coming down. So all, of, all the metrics that we're tracking are showing the same downward trend uh, that's still above where we were back in May. Uh, but we're seeing improvement uh, week over week. Next few slides are going to highlight some of the requirements and restrictions uh, that are in place nationally, what we have here in Palm Springs, and then we're going to take a, a quick look at Los Angeles, San Francisco, and New York City. Uh, the CDC's requirements are still, they're recommending masks for all individuals, regardless of your vaccination status, in some locations. So public transportation, hospitals, uh, shelter facilities, airports, anywhere we have a large gathering of people or where you're going to have people that are at higher risk. The CDC is also recommending that unvaccinated individuals wear their masks in almost all settings. Uh, there's a few places where they say that it's okay if you're outside uh, on a walk and things that we've seen in the past. Uh, the CDC is saying that vaccinated individuals can resume most normal activities, uh, but they are encouraging masks inside facilities just where there's a lot of people. The state of California is a little bit more restrictive. Uh, masks are required for unvaccinated people and recommended for everybody uh, in indoor settings, so retail, uh, restaurants, uh, amusement parks, and inside most government buildings. Uh, the state is also requiring proof of vaccination status or a negative COVID test for uh, significant events, something that we're also doing here in the city. The other thing that we have is masks are required regardless of vaccination status in indoor settings uh, and even in outdoor settings uh, where there's a large gathering of people, so Village Fest, um, and then proof of vaccination or negative COVID test for dining inside restaurants or drinking at bars. What we're seeing in other cities, Los Angeles is a little bit more strict. Uh, they're basically following the state's guidelines for masking, but they are requiring proof of at least one dose uh, of the vaccine to dine uh, or to go to indoor events. They are, they are considering requiring proof of vaccination for uh, retail settings and any anything that is an indoor setting. San Francisco is requiring masks in all indoor settings, uh, regardless of vaccination status, and they're requiring proof of vaccination uh, for people that work in a high-risk setting, so hospitals uh, and inside entertainment venues, uh, restaurants and bars. Uh, one thing that San Francisco does keep posting is that most of their city staff are continuing to telecommute to work or telecommute from work. Uh, and then New York is requiring proof of vaccination for uh, everybody 12 and up uh, for most indoor activities, and they're strongly encouraging masks for all individuals regardless of vaccination status. The last couple slides is just going to be the Chamber of Commerce survey results. Uh, one quick note that I have on this survey is the last survey the Chamber of Commerce did, uh, participation uh, was pretty low. There was only 428 respondents to the last survey. Uh, this survey had over 5,600 respondents. Uh, about 80% of those were Palm Springs residents, so uh, significant participation in this survey. Um, and what we have is, should masks be required indoors at uh, stores and other businesses? Uh, yes had 47% and no was 52%. You see that's a pretty close 50-50 through all these questions with uh, one exception. Uh, should vaccination, or should proof of vaccination or negative tests be required indoors at businesses? It's 40% yes and 59% no. Should businesses decide which health measures they want to use, masks or proof of vaccination? It's 48% yes and 51% no. I apologize for the small font, but the way the chamber broke up their survey, this just made the most sense. Uh, 
So proof of vaccination or negative tests should be required to dine or drink indoors. 48% yes, 51% no. Uh, and this is the big, big one. Uh, proof of vaccination or negative tests should be required to dine or drink outdoors. Only 25% said yes and 74% said no. Uh, proof of vaccination or a negative test should be required for large ticketed or permitted events such as music festivals. 54% yes and 45% no. Mass should be required for large city-sponsored outdoor events such as parades where people will be in crowded spaces outdoors for several hours. 41% yes and 58% no. This question is kind of important because we have pride coming uh, next Sunday. Oh, actually all next weekend. Uh, should the city end all COVID rules for residents and businesses? 49% yes, 50% no. So it, pretty 50-50 split except for that one question. And here's just the, the, the overall uh, how the numbers broke down. As I said, about 80% of the respondents uh, were Palm Springs residents. A uh, total of 5,647 people completed the survey. A little over 9,000 started it. Um, and then we do have a couple of uh, comments. Uh, I'm not going to read them. They're uh, available if, if council would like to read them. And that's all I have. Thank you so much for the detailed presentation and all the information. We very much appreciate it. Um, so are there questions or comments from council members? Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. I think we're all uh, starting to, to feel the, uh, a little tired, not just simply from the meeting, but uh, we're probably all getting a little tired of the restrictions that we've had to put in place. Uh, that said, um, we're entering into a really critical uh, period. Uh, it, it was uh, in uh, November and December and January a year ago that uh, things uh, peaked and turned uh, incredibly for the worse. Uh, I'm, I, I'm not in a hurry to uh, start taking down uh, all of the restrictions that we've put in place uh, just as we are moving into uh, a time period that a year ago produced such uh, havoc and cost so many lives in our community. Um, I would like to be able to say it's the time for us to uh, step away from these, but I, th I think we should proceed with some degree of caution. None of us know uh, when the next variant is going to come or if there's going to be one. Uh, and I, I'm certainly willing to amend uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with caution again, uh, the restrictions we have in place as, as it becomes clear that uh, they're not necessary and they're no longer being voluntarily supported. Uh, but uh, uh, given a choice right now, I'd like to see us get a little more time and a little more data uh, before we begin to uh, take down the restrictions we have. Thank you, Council Member Kors and then Council Member Woods. Great, uh, thank you, Mayor. And um, pretty much in agreement with uh, what Mayor Pro Tem uh, said, I think, you know, we're expecting that um, youth five to 11 will be eligible maybe in a week or two for vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, and given how many of their parents are essential workers, you know, indoors at restaurants and bars and other places and can, even if they're double, doubly vaccinated can still be contagious to them. You know, I'd like us to wait until they have had an opportunity to get vaccinated. Uh, I think the need to have them at village fest is one thing I would change now. Um, I think, people who are really concerned, you know, can get protective masks in that outdoor environment. And I think the, sur the one area of the survey wasn't split was, or was split, but not as much as, you know, parades, outdoor, unticketed events, um, which we don't require them now. Village Fest, I think, is an exception. 
So I might be inclined not to have it for that. Uh, so that, that's my general thinking. I would note that even with all our tourists, we're still half the cases of every week, you know, over the last five weeks of Palm Desert, per capita of Desert Hot Springs, of Cathedral City. And uh, while the cases are down from the high, they're not down to as low as they were. And just reading today about, you know, the UK where it's starting to get colder and they got rid of most of their rules, you know, they're now heading towards a crisis situation once again, compared to some other countries that have kept them in Europe. So I, I sure say the concern is we're going into the colder months, uh, but look forward to hearing what everyone else thinks. Council Member Woods. Uh, well, Council Member Kaur has said what I was going to say, but I'll just add a little bit more to it. Um, I, I, I don't think our outdoor mask mandate is being voluntarily supported. And I give you, you know, it's not. We have the homecoming parade. I didn't see anyone wearing masks on the sidelines or in the parade for that matter. Um, we had our downtown park opening, the same thing. Nobody was wearing masks when they did that. Village Fest, if you go to Village Fest, no one's wearing masks. There are those people that, can, that, will, that may want to wear them for their own protection. And I give them a thumbs up on that completely. I just think one area we want to change is uh, maybe our outdoor events. Thank you. I agree um, with that. So I agree that we should change for outdoor events that are not ticketed, that are not mass gatherings under state law, um, because the data is that, and we've had the public health officer the former one from the county tell us that he's not worried um, as an expert about incidental exposure um, from being outside. And so I think we learned from the data that that's probably not a risk unless it's mass gatherings like um, a music festival where people are really mixing and really, really close. So um, I just wanted to say that and jump on top of that if I could to, to agree. Um, but, you know, the, this pandemic is here to stay. We didn't know that, I think. Maybe we should have, but we didn't know that two, almost two years ago, a year and a half ago, and we started down this path. And, um, you know, it's interesting to see the split in 50-50. This has become such a polarized and political issue. Um, but I'm really proud of all the work that we've done to protect our residents. Um, and you can see that our residents... Um, by and large, I think, want these protections and want to stay safe because we do have such an at-risk community. Um, so we don't want to put additional burdens on businesses, um, but many businesses have asked us for these requirements. So I would just continue to ask businesses if this is impacting you, we want to hear about it, um, both negative and positive. I know we get a lot of those emails, um, but really just a plea to our community to our city staff, to everyone, um, please get vaccinated. Um, please get your boosters. Please get your flu vaccine as we move into the winter. Um, there are people in our community who are immune, immunocompromised who are not able to get the vaccine for various reasons. There are those of us who have children who are not able to get a vaccine um, and won't be for years and years. And yes, I'm very concerned that 0.04%, whatever it is, um, of the rest of the world has been vaccinated or has access to testing. And so we know that there will be new variants. So um, I very much, unfortunately, think the pandemic is here to stay. Um, and we just need to continue to do our best to follow data-driven scientific approaches. And so it sounds like that is um, to continue a mask mandate indoors. I saw Cathedral City has continued theirs until December 10th. So I might offer that we do the same and align with our neighbor in Cathedral City since we go back and forth between those cities pretty closely um, and that we change the outdoor events for non-ticketed events that can be spaced properly. Council Member Garner. I do just want to raise up the, the businesses issue. I mean, there's been several businesses that have reached out to us um, who are not in our downtown area that are really struggling. Um, and they don't have parklets. They don't have the ability to um, adjust in the same way that 
these restaurants do downtown, um, they're in a much different situation and it is impacting their business. And they're, they're telling us that um, they're struggling, um, which makes sense, right? Because like they don't have all of the clientele that downtown does. So if a bunch of people decide not to eat downtown, eat at that restaurant downtown because they're actively checking, it's not a big deal because there's more people flowing in all the time. But if you're off the strip, it is it is a challenge. And and that's who I've heard from in terms of restaurants having issues. It's the ones that are, are not um, downtown Palm Springs. Um, so I just want to raise that up. I, I mean, I, I completely understand the the concerns that that all of you are raising. And um, I absolutely con continue to support uh, wearing a mask indoors. Um, but I, I do just want to put that out there that, um, that, that there's, while there are, there are people downtown that are cool with all of this, there's others who aren't. And I, I just struggle because when I talk to those businesses and ask, you know, what can the, can we get you set up with, um, park lad or something like that, or it's just, they don't have the funds to do it. Cause again, these are much smaller businesses than, what you have downtown. Um, so I just, I don't know if there's something else that we can do in the meantime to assist them, um, but I think we should do it. Thank you. And just to be clear, I don't think that the Chamber of Commerce survey was at all limited to people who are downtown. And obviously the city council cares about all of our business districts. And um, for those of us who represent districts who are not downtown, um, we continue to um, support all of our businesses. Um, I've heard similar things from small mom and mom, pop and pop, mom and pop. <laughs> Small businesses, very small businesses, probably need a, gen a more gender neutral term for those. Um, we, I've heard the same. And so, you know, it's not all or nothing. I think that we've said that we can be really flexible to support businesses. So could it be that we um, change our interpretation even, or the actual um, requirements for which restaurants this applies to, right? You know, one example might be Teriyaki Yogi, a mom and pop um, small business in my district. And, um, you know, that's mostly carry away and they can't have um, a parklet. They have just very limited seating outside. Um, right. And so we might not be worried about spread in the same way when there's two, four people in the restaurant, you know, or a small amount versus when there's like a large, large scale restaurant that's indoors. So I might ask city staff, um, if we are hearing that type of impact on smaller businesses, and I'm not sure if that's across the board, um, but if there might be ways that we could either interpret the ordinance to only apply to restaurants and businesses where there might be a more significant concern of spread um, or where we're hearing that there's just too burdensome um, to you know, check vaccination when there's not um, staff to do that. Uh, Mayor, unfortunately, I think that would be difficult to do. Um, even establishing clear criteria would be a little bit difficult, but then enforcement, I think, even more so. Um, truthfully, it's it's probably, I, I would recommend that we do have consistent policies. Do recall or note that um, for the takeaway services, for delivery drivers, for lots of other things, if the mask isn't coming off, those proof of vaccination or negative test requirements don't apply. That, that has been an area we've seen some confusion. Um, doesn't apply eating outdoors. So for those businesses that maybe have substantial takeout service and a few tables indoors, it's only those folks sitting indoors and removing the mask that would have to demonstrate the proof of vaccination or negative test. Um, but as we said in the beginning, when we rolled out these restrictions, I think it would be preferable to avoid um, exceptions that not only create confusion, but administrative and enforcement difficulty. You, you certainly can. It's within um, your purview to direct those things. I just think it would be difficult. Thanks. So, yeah, we could look at if you have a host or hostess also need a gender neutral term for that. A host, I think we say, um, we, how we had talked about that. We could look at square footage, but I, I hear you on the enforcement of exceptions. Um, and we're probably not gonna design that policy right now. Um, so 
are there other comments on that or other items um, during this discussion from council members? Council member Garner. The other thing that was raised by another small business um, about this was having some kind of sense of, of timeline as well. Like when um, could they expect to be not having to check vaccination status? And I think the other hard thing about the restaurant vaccination status is that we don't, we, we, we just discussed this before, right? We don't have the ability to be regularly checking any of these businesses. And so you have some people who just don't check <laughs> and they, they are not going to, they don't care um, or want to, or have the capacity, whatever. Um, and then there's others like, you know, one of the restaurants that I've been speaking with who it's the rules. So they're doing it right, but it's hurting them, but they're doing it because it's the rule. So, um, but, you know, but they're hearing about other places that are not. And, and that's where I think the struggle really, really lies. Um, I, yeah, I, but, it, but if there's um, some way for us to, as we're moving forward in this, provide some sort of um, idea of, of when this might um, change in terms of, like, if, is there a threshold, right? Um, something like that especially when we're talking about restaurants and businesses that are not in a tourist area, um, it's mostly local residents. So if, if 85% and 90% of our residents are vaccinated, you know, does that make a difference? I'm just asking. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, I, what I would like to suggest, and I think Council Member Garner raised this is a great question. Everybody wants to know when. Uh, this is going to end. Uh, so uh, I think we uh, loosen the rules for uh, uh, outdoors. Uh, that seems to be clearly supported by uh, all of us uh, now. Uh, and come back uh, at, uh, at the meeting uh, in uh, the 1st of December and see where we're at. Has are we starting to see a trend like uh, uh, last December or, or no, November and December, or uh, is uh, are things continuing to uh, drop off in terms of number of exposures? And uh, let ourselves be guided by some of the data over the next month. Yeah, my concern is the yo-yoing of restrictions and rules. And that's what we've heard from our businesses and staff and, and, and workers is that it's really difficult to follow, right? If there's a threshold, if there's, it's up and down, it's required and then it's not. So I like Mayor Pro Tem's suggestion that we keep the rules in place. You know, based on the data, I would be willing to consider talking about the vaccination requirement, but then where are we gonna be in two weeks um, if there's another surge that's concerning to me in terms of changing the rules constantly on businesses, which we've heard from them too. Um, Council Member Woods. Uh, you said what I was going to say, but I wanted to say one additional thing that, that was brought up earlier by the mayor. Um, get vaccinated, this is real. Um, I just want to tell you on a personal note, my brother is in the hospital and something as easy as breathing. He has a breathing tube down both lungs. Something as easy as defecating, he can't defecate. You know, uh, it, I mean, it, it's really a very serious and he can't eat. Um, they have to turn him. Um, I just ask people to take this very seriously. Thank you, Council Member Wood. So sorry to hear about that. I'm thinking of you and your brother and your family. So I would make a motion that we uh, loosen, uh, remove the restrictions uh, for non ticketed outdoor events, uh, uh, effective as early as we can do so. Uh, and uh, that uh, with the balance of the restrictions, we revisit uh, them at the first meeting in December uh, based on uh, data that uh, is collected uh, between now and that meeting. Thank you. So that is a motion. Is there a second? Council Member Wood seconds. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, 
Can we have a roll call vote, please? Mayor Pro Tem Middleton. Aye. Councilmember Woods. Aye. Councilmember Garner. Yes. Councilmember Kors. Yes. Mayor Holstead. Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. So the next item, um, I assume that we're done for the evening. We continue the other items to the next council meeting. Um, so next we have city council and city manager requests and upcoming agenda development. City manager. Mayor and council, I don't think there's a lot we need to discuss this evening with the items that are pushed to the November 4th meeting. I think the 4th and 18th are pretty much spoken for at this point. Do recall we also have a special visioning session on the 20th, so we'll try to keep the meeting scheduled for the 18th a little shorter if we can. It's scheduled that way now, um, but given our rollover items, we might have to add a little bit to that agenda. So uh, with that said, I don't think we need any additional direction, but staff is certainly um, open to any additional direction with uh, future agenda items. Thank you. Is there any discussion from council on that? I would, yeah, I would like to uh, ask staff to evaluate and report back to us at, at what point they think it is prudent for us to move back to the dais uh, for our meetings and at what point uh, it will become uh, reasonable to uh, resume having the public present for our meetings. And I don't think that's imminent, but uh, let's uh, let's start talking about that as uh, hopefully things improve. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. I agree. Other requests from council members or direction on upcoming agenda items? Seeing none, we will next move to adjournment. The next regular city council meeting will be held on November 4th, 2021. That's next Thursday at 5.30 p.m. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, city staff, for your work and for staying late with us. Thank you to the public, and we will see you next week. Have a great evening.